All right. Let's load up some space news here. I'm going to take a quick fiver and then we'll go. Come on now. News. I will be back momentarily. Switch is over. And we are I want two launches out of this thing, guys. We're going to get two to today. So, yeah, we uh we got work to do. All right, I'll be back in a second. I'm gonna go grab some food. Discovery, go at throttle up. Discovery, go and throttle up.
right. Let's do this. Time for the space news, and there is a good amount of it. Okay. Welcome to the space news, everyone. <clears throat> All right. <laughs> nice crap post by Joe Thomas. That's funny. Perfect timing. Hey, Alleviate, there's this exclusive video from CNET on the X-59. Ooh. Yeah, you know what? I'll throw that in there at the very tail end. Uh, cool. All right, so let's jump in. First news, hot off the press. This was posted like less than 15 minutes ago. Check this out. Elon Musk posted pictures of their the third SpaceX autonomous spaceport drone ship, or ASDS for short, called a shortfall of gravitas. Yo, -ho, that thing is sharp. Wow. These autonomous spaceport drone ships are converted uh, river barges. Uh, they're Marmacs. Is, Marmac is the, the class of barge. There's Marmac 301, 302, or no, Marmac 301, 302, 303, and 304. SpaceX owns three of those. Uh, it's been very clearly heavily modified, though. Um, this does not look anything like the other drone ships. It's a, it's like a Block 2 drone ship. It's 300, 302, 303, and 304. There you go. Um, uh, here, take a look. Uh, <laughs> so the old ones very much look like a converted barge, okay? And who's, this is, uh, okay, so Timmy took this photo. This is Tim, Tim Dot. every day took this photo. Uh, here, look, I'll get out of the way of the, the URL. Tim Dodd Photography. Um, so that's what they, that's what Just Read the Instructions and Of Course I Still Love You look like. You could really tell that it's a converted barge. All of the equipment on the barge is in connexes, and the generators are just kind of sitting there. I mean, th that's an older picture. Uh, the barges have been upgraded over time to have stuff like, uh, you know, the Octo Grabber and whatnot. Hey, KOS MOS, nine month resub. So. They have upgraded thrusters and all the equipment on board over time and put like blast deflectors in here. Uh, but yeah, this new one looks completely different. Um, also important to note that this thing, the deck on this is a little bit bigger than a hockey rink. Yeah, it's in anybody that plays hockey or if you watch Stanley Cup, that Tampa, sorry, Canadians. Um, that's a lot of space. It's almost as big as. It's not, it's bigger than a hockey rink, but smaller than a soccer field or a football field. It's pretty friggin' big. And it looks like the new one is a really heavily upgraded version. It looks like it took all the upgrades here and incorporated them right from the start. So once again, that's the new one, or this is the old one. This is what the old one looks like. And this one is the new one. Look at that thing. It's a lot, lot sleeker. I mean, it looks wide enough for a Starship or Super Heavy landing if they could get that precise enough. I don't see why Super Heavy couldn't land on one of these things. Is it a catamaran? No, it's based off of a Marmac barge, so not a catamaran. Closer to a flat bottom hull, but... Oh, dude, this thing is so sharp, man. It looks so cool. Yeah, see? They took all the generators. All the generators for the ship are in the back here. Got radars right there. Uh, camera mounts, no doubt, on both sides. Do we see a Starlink antenna anywhere? Lights on board. The Octo Grabber house is definitely there. Yeah, it's it, this is 302, guys. It says it right there. See it? Do you want to see what these Marmac barges look like before that? Here, take a look at this. Want to see what it's supposed to look like? Uh, 
first of all, they're freaking huge. I'm trying to find, see if we can get like an overhead shot of one. It's just a flat deck. That's it. It's just a barge. That's what it looked like. More or less. What's the mass of the drone ship? Oh gosh, I have no idea what its hull displacement is. Ooh, cool. Yeah, 302. There it is. That's the same thing. Actually, let's see if we can find some pictures of 302 before it got modified. Yeah. Marmac 302, that's it. There it is. That's what it looked like. I'm getting to that, Phil. Yeah, that's the barge. That's what this thing looked like. SpaceX put thrusters uh, in each corner. Man, what a change. Also, yeah, I mean, I'm getting to it. I know that people are saying it. This thing is moving by itself. It has... It's autonomous. It can move by itself. The other, the other barges have stationary thrusters, but they can't move by themselves like this thing. And it looks like they took all the machinery. It looks like they took all the machinery on one side, all the machinery, and put it on one side. I wonder why they would do that. This there doesn't seem to be a lot of stuff on this side of the barge. Uh, the older designs had stuff on, like it looks like it had the same amount of stuff on either side holy crap look at those oil rigs out there those are big rigs that's a big freaking rig look at look at that thing weight balance yeah usually you wouldn't want weight to you wouldn't want all the weight at the back it'll list starlink antennas aren't pill shaped they're flat they're they look they look like a dish, like a dinner plate. A short fall of gravitas. That's the camera mount, and that's the tug line right there. That that triangular thing is the tug line. That's those are camera mounts. A short fall of gravitas. There will be a tugboat though for operational missions since autonomous ships are against the law. Yeah. Check the railing at the back for the Starlink dish. It's interesting. They really didn't put. They didn't. There's nothing up here. I wonder. I wonder what the, were they able to really consolidate down all the stuff? Cause look, check out the back. All right. There's these are definitely generators. There's a lot of generators on this thing. Uh, they definitely boxed up all those diesel generators in here. Uh, and then all it looks like all the equipment was consolidated down. These are. This is ship radar. There it is. That's the Starlink antenna. I see it right there. That's the star. See the dish right there? That's the Starlink antenna. No, th this is th these are ship antennas. Every ship has one of these things. And these have cut wings. The wings aren't as big as they were. Man, this thing's crazy looking. I dig it, man. That's really cool. The aft end has the garage. I think that, yeah, the garage is right there. It looks like it's got a fold-down door. That's so freaking cool, man. Oh, yeah. There's some folks just hanging around. Hanging around on the drone ship in the back. Huh. Man. Those white domes are satellite antennas. It's gyro balanced to move the ship to always point at a specific point in the sky. Are you sure, Daniel? I'm actually asking. Because I, I, I'm pretty sure those were explained as nautical antennas before, but I could be wrong. You work with this? All right, man. I believe you. The thing's a freaking monster. And, yeah, I can see why... Actually... Daniel, would these... Okay, I have a question now, dude, if you work with this stuff. Uh, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I, I actually want to learn, dude. I don't, like... Uh, I don't care if I get it wrong. It's about eventually getting it right. You know, failing is a part of failing is a part of that. Daniel, w would these be going with GPS here? Would they be looking at GPS? Or is it some other type of communication?
They have Intel Sat logos on it. Well, if they have Intel Sat logo, do they? Hold on. They do have Intel Sat logos on it. Well, that answers that question. I mean, I can see why you wouldn't want people on this thing when a rocket comes back down to land. I'm not an expert in the antennas per se. I work with IT for vessels, so basically those provide VSAT internet and TV communication. I mean, and in <laughs> Daniel, hey Dan, guess what Intel Sat does? Go ahead. I'll wait. Guess guess, guess what they do? <laughs> they do they do that. <laughs> Intel Sat is has TV communication and internet satellites, dude. <laughs> so, all right. That answers that question. <laughs> so it looks like the Intel Sat ones are double redundant, and that one right there is a phased array Starlink antenna. I know that one. What's your stream schedule like? Do you stream every day? Uh, Smoke, I uh, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Monday, Wednesday, Thursday streams usually go from noontime to about eleven midnight. So eleven to twelve hour streams on Monday. Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, Friday streams go 16 hours, and Saturday streams are 16 hours. I've been streaming 70, 80 hours a week for the past, like, year and a half. Yeah, and then on Tuesday in the morning, I do a stream where I go and stream working on my old muscle cars. Yeah. So, right now, the schedule is six days a week. Probably about 80 hours a week. Six days a, six days a week. I, I say five and a half, because... A six-hour stream working on the trucks on Tuesday is not a full shift for me. It's not even close. It looks like a maritime radar opposite the Starlink sat. Well, actually, if those aren't the maritime radars, then it has a spinny do on there. Do you think the video will be more seamless with this thing? It's possible. It looks like those are lights. Your last tech. Okay. Intellian NX series VSAT antennas gain Intel SAT approval. Well, that looks like exactly what we're looking at here, I'd say. I'd say you guys nailed that one and hit it right out of the park. That's exactly what that is. I will point out that less than 30 seem to be KSP. Doom, it, it fluctuates. There was a... Before I went on vacation, I streamed Kerbal like 60 hours in one week to try and get that SSTO deadline. So it fluctuates depending on the deadline. Which is good. It's a nice niche. It's a little bit easier for me. Alright. I can't believe that that's that's what that looks like and that's what it looks like now, dude. They they pimp this thing. This thing is sick. Hit it off for the night. All right, creeper. They could be in Marsat or Iridium, but yeah, either way. I am going to read that and it says, "Whoa, that uh, that's different." Then the... No, wait, 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 wait. No, no. How about one of these things is not like the others? One of these doesn't look like the others. Nah, people won't understand that. Never mind. Discard. People won't understand it. Somebody will take that out of context. It's not, it's not specific enough. Side note, we'll definitely be in Florida for the first week of November. Cool, man. Is Twitch your full-time job? Yeah, Halo. Mm-hmm. Just say wow. Yeah. Okay, here, here. Wow. That looks way different. How about that? Crafting tweets with chat. Good enough. That looks way different from the other drone ships. Why use more words when few do trick? All right, that's good enough. That'll work. 
But yeah, that is a big difference. Oh, Twitter took a dump again. See last. Okay, it's just a tweet. Yeah, you got to be careful with that, Swishio. You never know when you're going to say something that's going to piss somebody off, and then you have to deal with that, you know? And you have to deal with that the fact that you didn't think about your words enough to offend to not offend somebody, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's there's an art to it, man. Ah, uh, W, I don't see your last. Okay, what's this? Hackaday Starling Terminal Unit Framework Dumped. Oh, I don't know what that means, but that's cool. Still though. How fast do you think this thing is, uh, how fast do you think they're going right that, right there? Wait a minute, is it Derift, is it Deriftu? Oh no. Is it, are we busting five knots, wind whipping out my coat? You can't stop me, melon farmer, because I'm on a boat? The ship is going, buzz not, not. I mean, it's going pretty quick. I'd say five to ten, five to ten knots there. Closer to ten, Chad. I think you're right. Someone have read the software that is used by the Starlink antenna. Oh, neat. I mean, she's booking. She's going pretty quick. That's cool, man. This thing looks so sharp. Man, this thing when this thing comes into port with a Falcon 9 on it, and it's next to uh, Just Read the Instructions, it's going to make Just Read the Instructions look stupid. Yeah, dude, that's slick. All right. Anyway, next news. That's what it, and that's what it looked like. That is the exact ship, 302. It looked like that. Yep, not anymore. And that's what our, the other drone ships, the first generation drone ships look like. Yeah. See, it just had little mini azimuth thrusters on it before. I, can I just see one thing? I wonder if SpaceX put a bridge on this thing. Because you guys said, I mean, it has to be autonomous. Is, do you think they put, like, see if there's a bridge here, like a, a control area for the barge. I'm wondering. It could be, actually, that could be the bridge. Do we see any windows or anything? Nope. I mean, that could be, that could be a window. Nah, that just looks like paint. But there definitely is a door right here. There's an ingress, there's four of them, or at least. Well, that looks like the garage door. For the octo grabber. There, that's definitely where the octo grabber goes in and out. Probably just Bluetooth the phone to it. I wonder if there's a bridge on. Oh, they're carrying nitrogen. They're carrying GN2 aboard. Look, those are nitrogen canisters. I know that. Definitely nitrogen canister. That looks military. Definitely military. Yeah, it's to keep. It's to, yeah to pressurize Falcon 9 after landing. Yep, yep. Booster safing operations. And that's all on top of the Roomba garage. I wonder if there's a control deck on this thing, dude. Thomas, wouldn't it be crazy if the, if there was? Like, there's a control deck on here with, like, bunks and stuff. And the crew just got off the ship on the rocket lands and then they got back on. Like, that's what I'm wondering. Is the design... The design is definitely different. Is that a porta potty That's a porta potty on the sitting in that storage that okay why a bridge though side doors might be for accessing the generators um so swishio so a tug doesn't have to tow it all the way back to port that's the reason so okay all right you tell me if i'm reading too much into this if there's a head on there a port port ahead if there's a porta potty on there does that mean they're expecting people to be on this thing for a long period of time while it's out at sea? Right? 
<laughs> is that the solution? <laughs> I wonder. I wonder if this can. You know, if this has a crew aboard when it's when it's driving back, it can. It's very like because the other reason is why the heck else would you have it be self-propelled like this? Why would it? Why would you have it self-propelled? There's got to be some kind of crew on board somewhere. For a day or two. Well, that's it's only out there for a day or two, Admena. I wonder what the draft on this thing is. It's a dish. These barges were designed for to support rig tender operations and river operations. This is a, a barge was made by people on the Gulf Coast, so it's it's flat bottom, so it's it's a very low draft, low draft wide surface area, right? Harbor pilots, see Jim now, see what I'm talking about? So hold on. Let's let's just read the thread. Timmy's saying that's still just using its station keeping thrusters to move here, right? It doesn't have its own propulsion to go back from port. To, see, Timmy's asking the same question. Here, let's see if see if Elon's talked about it at all. Man, I hate just like Twitter stalking Elon Musk, but you learn so much from this damn thing. Nope. No tweets and replies. He talked about solar roof and power wall. The drone ships are out there for a week sometimes. They leave with the crew on it every time and are unloaded onto GoQuest. Yeah, okay. See, I'm wondering if, like, I'm wondering if they took, like, if they put, like, a crew quarters on this thing. How legit would that actually be? Man, what a difference, huh? All right. Yeah, that's what it looked. That's that's the same. Sh that's the same vessel. That's Marmac 302. That's what it looked like previously. I'd say they've uh, SpaceX has added a couple of small additions here and there. It does uh, 8.5 past light speed. Are you gonna build a drone ship in Stormworks? Oh God, I don't know. Maybe. All right. Anyway. A little, uh, little bit of Russian news here. Uh, the cosmonauts continue to search for the leak locations in the transfer chamber of the Zvezda module. Yesterday, Peter Dubrov opened the hatch, which was closed in April, and examined different places using the leak detector, but he found nothing. Uh-oh. Oh, dear. See that? See that little port right there on the back of the space station? Let's get a zoomed-in shot. Look at the radiation fried this freaking camera. See that port right there? The sides of that vestibule are leaking, or at least were. The ISS does routinely leak, and that's not that big of a deal, but it's leaking more than it should. And they found some cracks in there and sealed them, but they're still leaking and they don't know where. Don't worry, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, we just got through talking about the drone ships, right? You know how drone, how, you know, ships on water, they have a bilge and they, they're constantly sinking. Water splashes on deck and leaks down and it, it ends up pooling at the bottom of the ship by the keel, right? And then a bilge pump will pump it out, right? Uh, ships constantly take on water and they're constantly sinking. The ISS is constantly leaking. It's not going to be... It, it does that on purpose. It's just leaking isn't like a mission ending event here on any spacecraft by any means. Uh, it's just something that you have to take into account like a bilge pump on a ship. Uh, it's not like you're gonna have some crazy, just poof, like the thing pops. Like you're not talking about a really high pressure differential here. Vacuum is zero PSI and inside the space station is 15 PSI. That's a 15 PSI Delta, Delta P right there, right? Change in pressure. You're the tires in an automobile have a higher pressure differential between outside the tire and inside the tire than the ISS does. So it's not that big of a deal. They just really would want to keep track. You don't want to leak too much, but it's the, it does leak. I do not leak. You leak. And also at the station, some of the components on this station are over three decades old and have been in space for 20. That's a, that's a good, that's a good thing to, it's a good thing to. Good thing, to, good thing to say, I suppose. All right, anyway, back it up over here. Um, so the next bit of Russian news here is is coming from Dmitry Rogozin, the guy that runs the Russian space program. So 
Check out of the Proton M launch vehicle with a Nauka multifunction laboratory uh, module for the ISS was moved to the launch complex and it's scheduled for a July 17th or July 21st launch. Reserve dates are the 22nd and 23rd. So, whatever weird problems they had with Nauka, uh, they have fixed it and they've proceeded with fueling on the science module and they will launch it to the ISS very soon. Simultaneously, uh, Progress MS-16 will take uh, the PIRS module uh, and detach that. That's this kind of jug-shaped piece right here. They're going to detach that and replace replace that with Nauka. Um, the reason why they're getting rid of this module is because they don't they don't they could attach Nauka to this if they wanted to, but this is one of the oldest components on the station. They're going to dump it and they're going to replace it with another docking module called Prichal, uh, which should be attached to the bottom of the science module. This is marks. This uh, launch on sometime in late July marks the uh, first time a, a module exceeding like five to six tons has been launched up there since STS 133. Uh, there have been small additions and improvements to the space station over time, but nothing as big as this. Nauka is a very it's a very big module. Um, always s. Nauka is a gigantic freaking uh, module. It's about the size of a Greyhound bus. Uh, and there's the proton rocket that will carry it right there, being assembled uh, over at Baikonur. Uh, so, Old Dirty, that module will be deorbited with progress. So, uh, here, we could go over here. Uh... So Progress MS-16 is a resupply vehicle that's up at the space station right now. Progress is basically just a Soyuz capsule. It's a Soyuz capsule with no heat shield and no crew, crew quarters. It's just basically launches supplies into space. It's expendable. And what Progress, the MS-16 Progress module is going to do is that. It's going to undock with piers still attached to it. So instead of the progress capsule undocking right here on the SSVP, the Soyuz docking adapter, they're going to undock. Uh, they're going to undock piers with it, kind of like that. That's that's a picture of it going up. Um, they're going to undock the whole thing down here somewhere, right? So I mean, that's that's the wrong module. That's Poisk, but it, Poisk and piers are the same thing. So the module is going to un un undock here, and they're going to expend it. It's going to deorbit and burn up with the progress capsule. Progress capsules are expendable. Uh, that's not a progress. That's a Soyuz. You can tell because it says Soyuz on the side. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, they'll use the progress capsule as a tug to pull that module out and dispose of it. Isn't Nauka itself very old? Yeah, the hull was manufactured in the 90s. Early 90s. Oh, I have that picture, Novus. Don't worry. It's over here. And I have the other thing that you linked the other day, too. Oh, yeah. We're going to get into that. Um, you can fix the ISS leak with JB Weld. But, yeah, there's the picture of the module, right? That's Piers. So, you're looking... This is looking up at the station. So, if you flip this picture upside down, this will upside down this is the bottom right here that docking port is the nadir of the station uh and yeah so these docking modules these soyuz docking modules are also double as an airlock see the airlock hatch on the side so you can use them to dock ships or you can use them as an airlock uh, there's two of them there's piers and poisk there's one poisk is on the other side it's an exact copy of this um and then Pritchell is an upgraded version of this, if you want to see. Uh, Pritchell module is an upgraded, like a Mark II docking ring here. Pritchell looks also like the Space Core from Portal. So you have a lot of extra docking ports. Instead of one docking port front and one docking port in back, you have a lot of other docking ports. You could dock a bunch of different ships. Um, and this has an airlock inside of it as well.
Is that a manipulator arm? It's a the, it's Strela. Strela is the name of their remote manipulator system that the Russians use. It's not robotic, but it is a ro it is an arm, but it's not robotic. One guy sits at the boom of the thing and moves the moves his buddy around. Yeah, they basically put a cosmonaut out on a stick. That thing is basically a ball joint with you know one of those antennas or one of those those things, the telescoping magnets, you have a magnet on the end and you pull it out and it looks like an antenna. Yeah, that's what Strela is. It's very simple. Mm -hmm. So, yep, that's what's going on over there. Nauka will launch and then Pritchell should launch later this year. If you want a little bit of a size understanding here, that's the size of Pritchell. It's gigantic, it's bigger than you think. Cosmonauts on a stick, yeah, right. And then Nauka, Nauka is also very big. It's a big module. There's a picture of it. That's actually a very recent picture here, right before fairing encapsulation. Actually, now that's that picture's probably from four or five months ago. All the guts are still hanging out. Solar panel mount right there. The interesting thing we were just talking about Strela. This thing will carry a robotic arm on it. There's gonna there's a robotic arm that's gonna be on the back of this thing. It's gonna be packed on the back. Nice. Uh, and it's it was made by the Europeans. So this module will have its own robotic remote manipulator system. Why didn't they put Pritchell on Nauka? Um, not enough room in protons fairing. Send both at the same time. Yeah. It looks like the. So see this right here, MGB. That's a. That's Pritchell. Pritchell is that right there, this this docking hub. This one is just fixed onto the module. And then Pritchell is just one of these flying by itself. Uh, Pritchell should dock to right here. It should dock to the front. And then the back of this is going to dock to the Nadir port on Zvezda, uh, which is the service module for the ISS. Yeah, that, uh, Nauka is big. Nauka is the Russian word for science. It's a gigantic freaking module. There it is with some dudes standing next to it. It's big. Big module. Like I said, about the size of a Greyhound bus. If you see the dudes... Uh, that, see, that's a really old picture of it. Has it actually been confirmed that Pritchell is going to the ISS? It, 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 yeah, it's going. Mm -hmm. Yep. There's now. Can see the robotic arm on it? Pretty cool. Wait, what's this? What's this airlock thing? I don't know what that is. Uh, I'm not sure what's going on here. Uh, I don't know what that one is. I, I don't think it's going to have that. Oh, it does have a window on it. That's pretty neat. Cool. And of course, the Russian space station modules have the same docking port that Soyuz has on it. See? Soyuz just... The, the, the space station modules use the same modules to attach as the ships. Standardizing it makes it easier. The airlock is on the side of Rasvet right now. Oh, okay. Neat. Pretty cool. Nice picture of Proton. Proton's a good rocket. It just sucks that it uses hypergalls. It's a nice piece of equipment. All right. Anyway, uh, as you know, or if you didn't know, in the next couple of days, on the 11th, Virgin Galactic is going to launch Richard Branson on Spaceship Two up into space. Now it's not gonna they're not gonna be on orbit. It's just gonna go up into space for a second and then come back down. And then on the 20th, right, Blue Origin is going to launch Jeff Bezos and his brother and uh, Wally Funk on a suborbital flight for their new Shepard rocket, which also just goes up and comes back down. Um that's going to be on the 20th. Blue Origin announced that they were going to launch on the 20th first, and then Virgin Galactic came in and said that they were going to launch Richard Branson a week earlier, right? And it seems like it rustled someone's jimmies a little bit because, uh... Because Blue Origin released this. 
there's kind of this whole huge debate between Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin about, you know, if the people that launch on these things are classified as astronauts. Uh, the universally kind of regarded Kármán line, so the line where our atmosphere ends and space begins, it's not, it's, it's very blurry in real life uh, because Earth's atmosphere exponentially falls off. Traces of Earth's atmosphere have been found uh, out as far as the moon. It, don't get me wrong, it's not anything useful. You're not, you can't breathe on the moon, right? Heck, you can't even breathe where the ISS is, right? But there's still air up there. It's just, it's at a density that's microscopic, like not microscopic, it's just very small, right? So there's kind of, there's been like, oh, where, well, where's the Kármán line? How, like, how, where does space begin? What classifies somebody as an astronaut? Now, the most widely regarded Kármán line is about 62 miles that way, just straight 100 kilometers, right? But uh, in order to, the, Air, the U.S. Air Force in the 60s, in order to um, classify X-15 pilots as astronauts, they said, oh, well, it's 50 miles for us. Uh, so they gave people some astronaut wings, and then NASA gave people astronaut wings. So kind of where space ends and where it begins is kind of like this whole big thing and it ranges somewhere between, you know, I guess between 50 and 60 miles, right? <laughs> like, or between 80 to a hundred kilometers, give or, give or take, right? Now here's the kicker. Virgin Galactic by, goes into space by the Air Force's definition and Blue Origin with New Shepard, their rocket goes into space by kind of like uh, everybody else's definition, by NASA's definition. So, you know, Blue Origin announced that Jeff Bezos was going to fly on the NS-16 mission with his brother. Uh, uh, and then Virgin Galactic said, oh, no, we're going to do it. We're going to be the first billionaire to... Uh, we're going to send Richard Branson into space on the 11th, right? And then Blue Origin said, uh, yeah, except you're not sending it into space because yours doesn't get into space. That's literally what's going on here. Now, <laughs> if you like drama you can go believe what I just said. But the reality of the situation is, is that it's just pure freaking coincidence that both of these vehicles are ready at the same time. It's just pure coincidence, okay? Last, relevant. Okay, what's up? See this next. Uh, <laughs> Joe, I was, Vasya, I was gonna reply to Joe and say, uh, I was gonna reply to Joe and be like, hey, excuse me, other rockets have flown into the ground before yours, bro. <laughs> yeah. You know? uh, so, all right. Now it's fun. Oh, there's drama. Jeff Bezos and Richard Branson are gonna duke it out in space. I mean, I'd probably pay to watch that. I'm not gonna lie. And I think Jeff Bezos would win. Sorry, no offense against Richard Branson. Jeff is definitely swole as swole as hell. He. I mean, he's also a lot younger than Richard Branson, but I guess that doesn't mean much, right? Um, see my last about astronauts. Okay. I would say graduating from the school to become part of the astronaut corps makes one an astronaut and everyone else is simply a passenger. Well, oh, all right, more dissenting opinions. Yeah, I know. I, I don't know. I'd say orbit is what classifies that if you really want my honest opinion. But uh, once again, guys, it's, it's just kind of some cheeky fun. The, it, it is a pure coincidence that New Shepard and Spaceship Two were ready at the same time. It is pure coincidence. Uh, there's Richard Branson wasn't like, oh yes, we're going to beat them into space. Yes, yeah, well, I'm going to be the first billionaire to fly into space. There's it, that's not really what's going on. I mean, it is kind of fun, and it you know it's a fun thing. And but saying you got into space by first by like a week is, yeah, you technically got there Every first, but. In the scheme of, like, people that, you know, if you actually understand what it takes to engineer these vehicles, it's just pure damn coincidence that both of the vehicles are ready at the same time. Hey, Dragon, what's up? Look at it this way. The crap they're giving each other means we have progressed as a spacefaring society. Yeah. Mercury Redstone 3 reached an apogee of 101.2 nautical miles. That's where you earn your astronaut wings. That's right. That's right, Oh snap. Get him. Um, 
See last, see last. Guys, you know I'm trying to make this quick so we can get back to Kerbal, right? So the more you say see last, the more the more we're the more we're gonna the more time we're gonna take. Elon can do better, he can do an orbit. I don't think Elon's in this fight, to be honest with you. Um Richard Branson wasn't going to space until the second fully crewed mission, and now he's going on the first fully crewed mission. That sounds intentional to you. Possibly. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, let's keep going. So, yeah, a little bit of weird drama there. Uh, or not. I mean, I don't I don't think it is. I mean, maybe Reagan. Who knows? Uh, plans change with spaceflight. It's a dynamic environment. You know that. I mean, either way, like... Look, man, you can't tell, <laughs> like, some people are going to call bullcrap on this, but you can't tell billi what billionaires can spend their money on. I'm just happy that guys with money are willing to invest with space. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. They don't need to do this. They could sit on a private island and just reap the rewards, or they could, you know, do something else with it. No, no, they're making expensive space toys. I don't have a problem with that. No, keep doing it. Let's 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 get a battle between who can get into orbit with people first. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it, Anakin. Do it. When did Blue Origin get a salt mine? I don't know. But yeah, they did put out this infographic and uh <laughs> flies above Carmen line, internationally recognized boundary of space. Yes, no. Vehicle type rocket, high altitude airplane. Largest windows. Yes, it has an escape system. There's no escape system on the other one. Ozone layer impact. What? Asterix. Oh, boy. A recent study by Martin Ross of the Aerospace Corporation examined two types of suborbital vehicles. An air-launched space plane type using a hybrid N2O hydrocarbon-based solid propellant rocket motor and a ground launch type using liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. O2 and hydrogen propellants. It reported that a liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen rocket engine has 100 times less ozone loss and 750 times less climate forcing magnitude than an air-launched hybrid engine. Did, they needed to do... Wait. Did they... They needed to do a study to figure out that a Hydrolox rocket has, has less carbon emissions? I know it's ozone loss. I'm making a joke. Uh, you needed to do a study for that? or well, I guess you won't know until you prove it. I mean, I would lead with this one, to be honest with you. Flight history. 15 flights. Three. That's the one I would. D Maybe factor in how they get O2 and H2. I mean, pretty sure Blue Origin didn't make this graphic to show that they were uh, worse than Virgin Galactic. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying, man? Uh, to be fair, I would ride on both of these things. I'd probably ride on New Shepard because Rocket. Ugh, Lavi with the with the crap post. Rocket. High altitude airplane. Oh dear. Do you think it's a bit pathetic, though? No, not really. I mean, maybe, maybe a little petty, I guess, but I guess the thing to understand is that these two rockets are competing against each other, and there is a lot of money at stake here. Um, they're both suborbital tourist rockets, right? They're only designed to go up and come back down, but they're targeting a tourist market. And I think that, I mean, you know what's going to happen. You guys know, how, you guys know how people are. 
If Richard Branson launches first and then Jeff Bezos launches a few days after him, right? Who's going to get more press coverage there? You see what, see what I'm saying? Like, we could sit here and we could say, oh, Blue Origin is being petty. And, you know, yeah, exactly. But they also have an investment to protect here. You know, like, I mean, if that's the way they want to do it by putting out crappy infographics like this, like, you know, instead of, you know, actually, like, maybe they should move the launch date up. I don't know. But then again... You want to you want to make sure you're not when people get involved with space flight moving it up just for bragging rights isn't probably isn't the best idea. Um, so I, I think this is more just them protecting their investment than anything. And if people have a problem with that, I get it. Yeah, no, I I def, I mean optics are optics, man. But what do you do if you're Blue Origin? It's kind of a lose lose situation. You don't want to put Jeff Bezos on a rocket that's not ready. Someone. Someone in this chat said, and very, very astutely, you know, observed that uh, Jeff Bezos is by far and away the most expensive thing ever launched into space, ever. So, uh, you, you really want to make sure that you don't screw this one up. So, I mean... Yeah, I mean, this... Aerospace engineering, the aerospace industry is pretty cutthroat when it comes to this stuff. Getting a contract or getting good positive press could be, is very, is believe it or not, is pretty, pretty dang vital, you know? So, I mean, I will say this, and don't get me wrong, guys, I'm not picking a side here. I like what Blue does, and I like Virgin Galactic as well. Um, I, I, pfft. More rockets, yes, please. Um, I will say this: it takes some balls to put yourself on a rocket that your company made and launch yourself into space, even if it is on a suborbital flight. That takes some pretty hard stones, right there. Uh, either way, I mean, it's pretty nuts. Be a Blue Origin's just rude, and I don't like them. Uh, that's the corporate world, Loopy. It's cutthroat, bud. Yeah, once again, you don't have to like what they say. I think it's important to understand where they're coming from, but you don't have to like it, you know what I mean? Understanding is super important. This feud is getting some great space PR. That's right, Ida's, it is. Maybe that's why they're doing it. Maybe throw, I mean, Swishio, you said it. Any publicity is good publicity, guys. We're talking about it, aren't we? I think in this day and age, it's not really about having good press or bad press, right? It's about getting people's attention. Any press is good press, right? That sounds, that sounds correct to me. I don't mean that. See the post before. Oh, okay. What's up? Did you see that Blue Origin froze a bunch of media who wanted to come to cover the flight? I'm sure they have their reasons. I wish they were a little more forthcoming. There's a lot of cool stuff that they're working on that they just don't tell anybody about. Like, I mean, New Glenn Progress, for instance. That's a pretty good one. Yeah, Farm, that's... You know, I listen. I like listening. I like listening and understanding and analyzing the situation before I weigh in on it. In on it. Don't get me wrong. I'm not perfect. Sometimes I weigh in on something and... I thought I was right, but I'm not, you know? Moment you think you got it figured, you wrong. Yeah, the world ain't what it seems, is it, Gunny? All right, anyway, so that's what's going on there. I won't touch, I won't really cover it anymore. I mean, it's, either way, it's still cool. Still cool flights, and it's going to be fun to watch. Still got the shovels. Do you think that either company is going for bragging rights? It's possible, Reed Dog. Sure, why not? I think once again, I think they're just after the. I think, I think they're just after the press coverage. If you're trying to sell your launch system, it you know it helps to say that oh we were the first ones to launch people into space you know on for suborbital tourism right? We're not we're talking about stuff that goes up and right comes right back down, not the orbit stuff. That 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 competition already got won by Wario over here. Apart from the garbage, heard him. Okay, so what? What's this, Loopy? 
I've heard from multiple prominent space reporters the, that they were denied access to cover the first crew launch. Blue even told reporters who didn't apply that they were, weren't invited and favored trusted media instead. Yeah. Blue, yo, yo, let me do your PR, man. I'll take care of it. Holy crap. This is Robin C. Mingell of Supercluster. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. I got you. I mean, yeah. I don't know. I, Loopy, and this just kind of feeds into that Blue Origin is really not interested in having good or bad press. They're just interested in getting your attention, which seems to be the M.O. for 2021, huh? I mean, Loop, you want to know the best way? <laughs> well, not, you probably already know this, but the best, the best way to, you know, you know, I think the best, the best thing that you can do in this day and age, if someone's doing something that you don't like, or something, there's something that you don't like, the best thing that you can do in this day and age is ignore them. That's almost, that's, that's like worse than, you know, acknowledging it and being upset with it. Oh, I hate you. You're a piece of crap. Yes. Let the hate flow. Can you imagine if, can you imagine if like in Star Wars, you know, at the end of Return of the Jedi, the Emperor is like, ha, 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 yes, yes, become my slave. And Luke's just like, meh, I don't think about you at all. And to just force choke them or something, that would be funny. I mean, there would be no conflict and the whole, it would, it would render the entire plot useless, but it would still be funny. He's just taken, took a, took a, took a note from his dad. Hmm. I don't like you. Oh, I can't chain like can't chain lightning me right now, Emperor, when you're freaking choking. All right, Dad, let's get out of here. Right. You know, just any press is good press in this day and age. And the worst thing that you could do to if you don't want, you know, if you don't like what people are saying or the best thing that you could do is just. All right. Sure. You know, <laughs> but I don't know. I don't know what's going on with Blue. I think th I think that that's where they're going. I think they know that any press is good press in this day and age. But yeah, who knows? Anyway, next news. I'm done. I won't pay it any more mind. I just want to see stuff launch into space. I don't care if it goes up and comes back down, to be honest with you. Or goes into orbit. I mean, I'd prefer orbit, to be honest with you. To be even more honest. Times two. Like, two times the honesty. At least three honesties, okay? But, uh, hey... More space is good space. More rockets is good rockets. Because that gets us pressed for space, like what Ipes said. Good call. Honest underscore S-A. That's me. Yeah, be money. Hey, it is what it is. On a similar level, SpaceX hasn't, hasn't given media access to Starship. I mean... Kyle, you ain't wrong, but also I can literally look at Starship's build site right now on a live stream. <laughs> I think the media access is pretty unprecedented, and not, but it's not in the conventional means, right? <laughs> but I, I get what you're saying. But yeah, I mean, we say that, but on the other hand, you know, it's I can literally go see what they're working on on Starship like right now. <laughs> All right. Anyway, so this one, this one's coming from Launcher here. This next bit of news. This is the first part where we 3D printed. Uh, this is the first part we 3D printed at our new Launcher HQ and factory. Uh, orbital propellant tail. Whoa, cool. Dude, that's sick. Launcher is another small sat provider. That looks like a laser centered aluminum tank right there. Ball. 3D printed, dudes. That's pretty freaking cool. 3D printed aluminum, which is pretty gnarly. That's awesome. There we go. Launcher is a small sat, a small sat provider. Let's go look over here. Let's see. Anything cool? Hey. Oh, yes. Nice tank, mate. Eh? Hmm. 
Launcher reports that Orbiter, which features an, a, uh, an aluminum, an AM propellant tank combustion chamber, and an injector as part of the chemical propulsion module, is contracted to fly with SpaceX. Ooh. Cool. That thing is gonna. Yeah, yeah SpaceX. Hey, cool. Neat. Factory in LA where we'll build ships that leave Earth and explore the stars. Uh, neat. Hey, oh, oh, I like it. I like how clean it is. Um, be careful. That one's probably really good. Is that? I, I mean, I don't. I can't tell if that's a. If it's a CNC machine, but I think it's a lathe because Haas machines like spinning a lot. All right, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, launchers down the street from SpaceX. That's cool. Boo! <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's it's such low hanging fruit, and I'm a piece of crap for doing it. I don't care. You work with the, you work with the dudes and CNC machine in the, in that picture right there. Or the, oh no, that guy over there. I don't get it. Haas has a Formula One team, and their cars, their cars don't drive very well. They like to spin a lot, but that that's probably because of the driver. Whoa, that's sick though. Look at that. That's cool. That, yeah, it's a five-axis CNC machine. That's really freaking cool. I love it. Giant chess piece. Looks like it's made of wood. This might be an STL. It might be a stereolithography. But wait a minute. No, it can't be. That would mean they'd have to center the aluminum around it. No, this is definitely metal. Maybe they're making the nozzles out of copper or something. But then again, that does look like it's 3D printed. I don't know. Uh, okay, yep. Nope. Uh, I'm just going to go out on a limb and say I have no idea what the hell that is. I can tell it's a rocket engine, and I can tell it's a rocket engine in a 5-axis CNC machine. I don't know what this is made out of, and I don't know how it was manufactured. Facts. STL. Stereolithography. S. Stereolithography, so 3D printing, has been around for a very long time. It's be it's used in manufacturing processes. It's been used in manufacturing processes for a long time to make casts and stuff. Yeah. And negatives uh, for, for, for manufacturing. 3D printing's been around for a really long time. It's 3D printed in copper. Damn, that's cool. Okay, so if it's 3D printed, if that thing is 3D printed in copper... They have it in this five-axis mill to be able to probably drill and tap all the all the holes for it. That's my guess. Just a guess, though. Either way, still really freaking cool to see. That's awesome, dude. I got it, Hell Hydra. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Anyway, is an SDL... A 3D file format. Yep, mm -hmm. that's what STL stands for, stereolithography. Once again, uh, I was talking to my dad about this, who, and my dad has been working in machine shops for the better part of 30 years. Uh, he, when I first showed, talked to him about 3D printing, he's like, "I'm like, I got this new 3D printer. 3D printing is cool." He's like, "What are you talking about? Are you new? That's not new. People have been doing that for the better part of a half century." They're using st they use stereolithography to make uh, like cast casting pieces and stuff. I'm like, oh, well now that doesn't seem as cool. Thanks, man. And he's like, no, oh, you're welcome. I'm like, oh, all right. It's yeah, it's a mahogany space engine. It has that engine has launcher has many leather bound books. The home version is what's new. Yep, yep. I'll cast you. In what role? I messed it up. What is your damage, little boy? You've got a sick and twisted world perspective. All right, check this out. 
gateway news. Ready? <laughs> so this is coming from Chris B. at NASA Space Flight. Northrop Grumman has finalized a $935 million contract to provide the Habitation and Logistics Outpost module for Gateway. Northrop Grumman will complete design and development and integration tasks with the power and propulsion element provided by Maxer. So NASA did have a press release here. Um, I'll link the press release if people want to check into that. Long story short, uh, these are the first two components to Gateway. Gateway is a uh, a lunar lunar science facility, I guess. It's not a space station <clears throat> per se. It is a it is a spaceship, and it can it can maneuver on its own. Um, that will be out in cislunar space in what's called a rectilinear halo orbit. Um, this is basically going to be a staging point for exploring the moon, but also the gateway doubles as the first deep space logistics outpost that humanity has made. Right? It's it's a habitable element that's outside of Earth's magnetic field. So this will enable us uh, long term long term sustainability around the moon and uh, basically a good staging point to be able to get back down to the surface. The first two elements of the gateway are the power and propulsion element, which is the power and propulsion element is was made by Maxer. It's basically a geostationary satellite. Uh, with nothing on it. It's a geostationary satellite bus. So they different satellite manufacturers have different chassis, right? So they have a chassis or a sat bus that, you know, uh, say you wanted to buy one and you wanted to put your antenna on it to communicate with your ground stations. They You buy the sat bus and then they put the antenna on and then somebody launches it, right? Like SpaceX or ULA or whomever. Um, Maxer made this, and it's based off of one of their satellite buses. And this satellite bus that they based it off of has propulsion elements on it. It has solar electric propulsion. So it has electric thrusters. Uh, electric thrusters utilize the Hall effect. Uh, they basically pump xenon gas into a combustion chamber and then send an arc of electricity through it. And the ionization of the xenon gas actually provides thrust. They don't provide a lot of thrust, but they're very, very efficient for... They're very efficient for what for what they are. Um, that's why the uh, Gateway has the gigantic solar panels on it. So that's the power and propulsion element. And then on the front of this satellite bus is just a, a, a docking port. It's an international docking system s system standard. So an IDSS and the Northrop Grumman, the Northrop Grumman, Northrop Grumman is going to work on the habitation and logistics outpost, which is basically the core node for Gateway. Uh, this is where astronauts will eat, sleep, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, it's basically just a core core node, similar to the core nodes on the IRS, uh, IRS on the ISS. Nice core nodes on the IRS. I mean, hopefully this project doesn't get audited. That would suck. Anyway, no. Um, moving on. So that has a bunch of radial ports on the sides here for other things to attach to it, and one on the front as well. Um, this. These were these modules were originally supposed to be launched separately, but uh, NASA changed kind of uh, changed uh, stuff up a little bit, and these modules are scheduled to launch as a as a yeah, they were they're scheduled to launch in tandem inside of a Falcon Heavy. Falcon Heavy is going to push the the core node of the gateway and the the propulsion element out to the rectilinear halo orbit. Uh, or at least get it on a transfer out to the moon, and then the gateway will maneuver itself into position. Yeah, these these were originally supposed to launch it launch separately. Uh, this was supposed to launch. It could have been launched on another vehicle. It could have been launched on an SLS, uh, an SLS Block One B. Uh, but they decided to couple them together and then launch them in one shot, which is pretty cool. The thing must be very rad shielded. I think that's what these ridges are. Swishio, yeah. Mm -hmm. The IRS has a space station? You don't know, man. Black projects. It was a joke. The habitation module is based off of Cygnus Supercraft. Mm -hmm. How big is this thing? I mean, this can all fit inside of a Falcon Heavy fairing, so I'd say that's, that both of these things, minus the solar panels, obviously, are about the size of a school bus. Yeah. An extended Cygnus capsule is basically what this is. Pretty sure that Gateway will do the translunar injection. Well, Core, I mean, keep in mind, you could, Falcon Heavy could put it on like a super sync orbit, right? 
get it like a th halfway there and then this thing will just keep using Oberth to get out there. Do you think that's what it's going to do? I don't know. I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure. Falcon, what's Falcon Heavy's TLI? How much can it move to the moon? It, it must be, I'll bet you it's, Falcon Heavy can move about 60 tons into low Earth orbit. Uh, TLI is probably like 10, 15. So my guess is that it's probably going to put it on an, they'll probably put it on a high eccentric orbit for insertion and then Gateway will finish it up. It's supposed to do a sea trials equivalent. Interesting, interesting. Are they going to expend Falcon Heavy or recover it? I'm not 100% sure it was it on that mission. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, let's hope the Flood don't exist out there twitching if we're launching a Halo module. I agree. Cool. Yeah, Cor, I yeah, you're right. I remember that now. But it's not like in low Earth orbit. It's going to put it into... Isn't it going to put it into Mio or some kind of trans... Not transfer orbit, but... Uh, a high ex high eccentric. Three drone ships, three boosters. But I tell you what I'd do, I is, I'd land two drone two boosters at the same time on two drone ships. Yep, damn straight. Always wanted to do that. I figure I could hook that up. Cause you know drone ships dig guys with rockets. The kind of drone ships that would land two boosters on wood. Yep. In before Jim is Master Chief. Well, he has the mustache for it. Meaning tenacity like Master Chief. I don't know if Master Chief... Ma Ma John would have a mustache, okay? Master Chief would have a mustache. That makes sense. He's a petty officer. Of course, he's a Ma Ma Master Chief petty officer. Of course he has a mustache. Alright, anyway. So, that's pretty cool. Uh, they're basically... That, that's scheduled... When is that scheduled to launch? Hold on. Let me Let me check the press release real quick. There's another cool render of it. Uh, it would be down here. Okay, the firm fixed price contract is valued at 935 million. Under the contract, Northrop Grumman would be responsible for attaching and testing the integrated, integrated habitation and logistics outpost with the power and propulsion element. And it will also lead the integrated PPE and Halo spacecraft turnover and launch preparation with SpaceX and support activation and checkout of the Halo during the flight to lunar orbit. NASA is targeting a November 2024 launch to the for the integrated spacecraft on a Falcon Heavy rocket. Cool. Got it. Hey, Builder. The big news of the whole thing is that the launch date pretty much confirms that 2024 moon landing won't use Gateway and NASA's targeting November 2024 to launch the integrated spacecraft on a Falcon Heavy rocket. Ye I mean, it might, Hell Hydra. You don't... Well, actually, it might. Who knows? Either way, though, it's important to get Gateway off the ground, figuratively and literally, uh, because Gateway and having a, having a logistics outpost out there, even though there's going to be nobody on it, is an anchor point in the, at the moon. Um, I've often said that stations and places that humans can hab habitate in space for long periods of time are the key to sustainable space programs when it comes to government stuff. Uh, all you have to do is look no further than some of the some NASA programs that have lasted the longest period of time. The shuttle program lasted 30 years. Well, why? Well, it built a space station. And the space station is space stations lasted 20 up in space. That's not even including when they started the project in 1993, right? So having an anchor point in space and having a place where you can send people and building that infrastructure out might seem a little bit counterintuitive, but it also is a way for NASA to basically say, if somebody comes knocking on their door and says, this is a waste of time, right? Don't do this. Why do you need to do this? It's, you know, you're not, like, you know, we don't want to do this anymore. NASA, well, NASA could say, all right, fine. You want to abandon our $935 million space station that we have up there that we can send people to? And, oh, by the way, we need a rocket to get to it as well, right? So this is sustainability. It's sustainability from for the space program for in the long run. It's something that the Apollo program didn't take into account. 
And well, I do think that Apollo is sustainable architecture, if the Apollo program at some point had like put a Skylab out by the moon, it would I think it would have been less likely to have been canceled. It's these kind of it's these kind of points in space and these programs that involve having basically an anchor up there, right? That help keep these programs alive. So, you know, even though NASA even though NASA doesn't need the gateway to get down to the moon in 2024, they're still going to put it up there because that basically keeps the Artemis program sustainable for a long period of time. And from there, they can start contracting people like SpaceX to resupply this to resupply it. Uh, it, to resupply the gateway logistics outpost and then they can keep SLS in the running to and launch it more to get people out out there for sustainable exploration on the moon and that means well if we have an anchor point out at the moon and we want to and it's a gateway to explore the moon right well we're going to need landers now we need two landers you know because redundant dissimilar architecture it the gateway kind of helps is like the anchor point for an entire puzzle that keeps lunar exploration sustainable and it will keep it sustainable for a very long period of time if done correctly and i think we're on the right track i think nasa wanting to put the gateway out there in 2024 right when we land on the moon is a really good idea and i think that's the reason why they decided to launch the modules together and uh on a falcon heavy yeah it's it's a really smart idea that's a really good way to do that they decided to throw them on a Falcon Heavy because the SLS wouldn't have been able to move that stuff out there in time. This way, you get the gateway and you get SLS operational and you get people on the moon all in the same year. Basically, if that gets done, that forges NASA's kind of uh, pathway for a pretty good period of time and it makes these programs very, very difficult to get rid of, which is good. That's a good thing. That's what we want. And then that's not even including what Elon's doing with Starship, right? It's not even including that. That on top of it, man, we're looking at a sustainable, a sustainable spaceflight economy here if we play our cards right in the next couple of years. It's not bad. We're already seeing the start of it with, with Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic, like what I was just talking about. So this is a good thing. This is good. Good stuff. Gateways on the books. That's very good. That's a very good thing. And Gateway has the support from both the ESA and JAXA. With international partners, killing it is going to be way harder, correct? That's right. I'm in a little spat with a friend on why going to Mars is a good idea. He says that it would have no benefit. What are some of the positives of going there besides the obvious stuff? Builder, I personally believe that climate change is not a arguable topic. We're definitely doing something to the environment, right? And we definitely should try and figure out what that is. Absolutely, of freaking lutely You don't add 7 billion people to this planet and hope that it's going to stay the same, right? Now, what does that have to do with going to Mars? Don't you think that going to Mars is a good control group? If we can figure out why Mars is the way that it is, because Mars, from as we understand it currently, basically had its atmosphere whip off because of climate change, right? If we can understand what happened on Mars, that could give us a better control group to make sure that we don't screw things up here on Earth. Same with Venus. Same case could be made to go to Venus. Got to figure, Venus is another possible outcome of rapid climate change. Mars and Venus are both, both ev like evidence that climate change does happen. Going, in, going to Mars and figuring out what happened there and going to Venus, not landing, don't land, not a good idea. Uh, and at least observing Venus and figuring out what happened with those planets can help us here on Earth, big time. And I, Builder, I'll be honest with you. Let's, I'll cut right to the chase. I, it's really hard to argue against the climate change argument, huh? You know, because the guy will be like, oh, we shouldn't do that. I'll be like, oh, I'm sorry, you don't like climate change? You, you don't think that's worth it? Oh, geez. If you, wa if you want to play that card, you can, you know? I think that's a good way to explain it. I've used that that way to explain it to people all the time. We have to go out into space. We have to explore these planets to understand our place in the universe. Because if we understand our place in the universe better, that way we can... If we understand our place in the universe better, we can master the universe. 
Nobody ever took a college class, right? And knew everything from the start, all right? If they did, they wouldn't need to take a college class, right? Or just, or school, right? We need to understand where we are in this bigger puzzle in the solar system and then by proxy the universe or the galaxy and then the universe right if we can understand why we're here and how we got here and why our planet is the way that it is the better we can understand that the better we become masters of our domain straight up Zanku, if you want to explain it like that, go ahead. I find with the mining precious metals on Mars argument, I find with the mining with the mining precious metals on Mars argument, that's a hard thing to sell, especially if somebody knows a little bit about space flight and knows the challenges involved with going to Mars and back. That's why I just I just say the climate science one. That's a real easy sell. Yeah, also, if we do mess things up, it'll be good to have a colony off-planet. Sure. Nobody's saying it isn't, DJ. All right, what is this, Thomas? Will a shortfall of Gravitas be fully automated, no tugboat required? Yes. Yes. My man. No tugboat required. How'd they... Uh, Thomas, how'd they... Uh, just Search for life is a good reason as well. Well, the search for life, Novus, encompasses understanding our place in the universe. Our place in the solar system. How does humanity fit into this puzzle? I think that's a really good question to ask and a really good question to want to figure out. For multiple reasons. I mean, there's the whole hum humans are explorers. It's, it's what we do, right? But once again, you're not gonna sell, it's hard to sell people that, that are realists about things. It's hard to sell people, oh, well, we're gonna go because we like exploring. That's a hard sell for people, you know? Uh, I think that finding our place in the universe and becoming masters of our domain is probably the best way I can explain that. And climate, figuring out climate, the climate on Mars and Venus is a really good way to understand that. It's very easy to. It's very easy to. Uh, that's a very easy thing to explain, you know. He says that. Climate change is the only problem that we, and that we should only fund programs based around that. And, and so builder, go back to your buddy and say, okay, that's fine. You're trying to solve, you're trying to fit one puzzle piece in, but ignoring the rest of the puzzle pieces. You can't figure out where more than one puzzle piece goes at at one time. Look, man, all these things in my mind, all these things are part of a gigantic puzzle, right? And if you focus on one piece and fitting one piece at a freaking time and trying all the different ways to fit that one frigging piece, right? You're never going to get, it's going to take ages to get the puzzle done. So you look at a piece, you fit it for a little bit, you grab another one, fit another one, right? Nobody solves a puzzle one piece at a time, all right? Our brains just don't work that way. I mean, I'm sure somebody does out there, but you get what I'm trying to say. Like you and I wouldn't solve a puzzle like that. You know, you, you try one piece, and if it doesn't fit, you put it away and find another piece and find shapes that look like they fit. We can do both of these things at the same time. In fact, saying, saying I think that saying that, we oh, we should focus on Earth because of climate change is scientifically detracting from our understanding of climate change. It, you, it, when you're being scientific, right, you have to have a control. That's part of the scientific method. Just monitoring Earth is a really good way to get not good data. That's a that's a really good way to get bad data. You know, if you're trying to collect data and you have an array of information about a certain planet, wouldn't it be prudent to, you know, have a control? Venus and Mars are the control. And well, if we're going to get a satellite out there, we might as well send some people out there too for multiple reasons, right? It's all about finding our 
find finding out how we fit in and finding a symbiosis with our environment like that's the that's the real easy way that I think about it could you solve a puzzle by putting all but one piece back in the box and ignoring it yeah caveman I think that's shutting yourself off from one way of thinking just because you know you think that that way isn't vital is not being scientific at all that's being opinionated and guess what opinions don't have any room in science okay it's all about the numbers. It's what you can prove. It ain't what you know. It's not what you know, Jake. It's what you can prove. Yeah, Demos, for sure. Anyway, let's keep going with the news. So, Speaking of Falcon Heavy moving stuff out to lunar orbit and gateway and stuff, Jeff Faust posted this useful chart from NASA's Launch Services Program presented today at today's Planetary Sciences Decadal Survey Steering Committee meeting. Comparing performance of launch vehicles at several characteristic energy values. Hey. Hey. Okay. Nice. So basically, these are further into space. That's that's characteristic energy. The higher the characteristic energy is, the further you can go into space. Antares 232. I forget what 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50 is, to be honest with you. I forget how far that is into space. Uh, it, it, I, I'm not 100% on that one. But you've got a bunch of good comparisons of vehicles here. Jupiter is 55. Yeah, okay, so this is the Jov Jovian moons right there, right? I think Scott replied to this with what bodies it can go to. Uh, Scotty, don't. Ah, well, Jeff replied to his own thing. For comparison, performance, uh, the performance of various SLS versions from a separate presentation at the meeting. Don't assume additional kick stages. So block one... Block block 1B and block 2. Yikes. That's beast. Yeah, okay. So, characteristic energy. You'd need 80 C3 to get to Jupiter. 15 for Mars. Okay, and we also have payload mass up here too. Putting the C3 numbers into plain English. Okay, let's Engli English me. Let's go. Ah, here we go, Scott. Scott made a very, very useful chart. Thanks, guys. Uh, so, moon L1, L2. So, those are Lagrangian points between the Earth and the moon. Neutral points of gravity. So, L1 is where a space station could be. L2 is where James Webb is going. And then we have... So yeah, 10 Mars, so 10 is Mars and Venus, 40 is the asteroids, and then 70 is, is out by Jupiter. That's the, that's the Jovian moons. Let's see. So Falcon Heavy Expendable can move about 15 tons to the moon. Hey, I said that earlier with the halo module. Nice. It could put that thing on translunar injection. That's cool. Awesome. Well, actually, I don't know. It depends if the gateway module weighs that much. <laughs> Falcon Heavy can do 12 tons to a Mars transfer orbit or 10 to Venus. Yeah, you got to counter, you got to slow down. You speed up to get to Mars. You basically have to do the space equivalent of slowing down to get to Venus. That's why the, the payload capacity is lower. You need more energy because when, you try, when you're trying to go to Venus, you have to lower your aphelion, which is your perigee around the sun. You have to lower your aphelion to Venus's orbit. And that basically means you have to go against the way that the Earth is spinning, or the Earth is orbiting, right? And part of that is negating out almost 66,000 miles an hour, because that's the that's the speed that Earth is moving around the sun. Six, I think it's like 60, six, yeah, 66,700 miles an hour. We're going pretty fast right now. Uh, you don't have to negate all of that, to be clear, just a little bit of it. But that's why, even though Venus is closer, right? 
uh, Venus is by, by like distance when Earth and Venus are near each other, and when Earth and Mars are near each other, even though Venus is closer, you still are gonna you still need more energy to stop. But in KSP, you use less delta V to go to Eve than you go to than you do to Duna. It's almost like KSP is in real life, Luizo. Novel concept. So this is Falcon Heavy right there with recoverable. Look at the hit that you take. Check out these check out these hits right here. Uh look at what recoverability or getting your boosters back. Look at what it does to payload capacity. Your payload capacity is cut by about two thirds. Two thirds right well, a little little more than a third right there. As you go higher and higher, that's half. Alright? That's one third, and that's that's one third as well. And that's one oh jeez. Sixty see see what I mean? It goes down. That's the the further you go out, the more that those boosters landing on their own and not being used to accelerate is going to kill you with payload capacity. What about Antares? Antares can't go much further with much further with anything useful than Venus right there. Hmm. There's Vulcan. Uh Kuro, I saw you asking about Vulcan. I'll I, I could explain it a little bit later, some uh, if you want. I just gotta make I gotta keep time here because we have missions to do in Kerbal. There's Atlas Five in the smallest configuration and the largest configuration right there. Delta Four heavy, no longer available. Eh, Delta Four's numbers are pretty damn good. They're not Falcon heavy, but they're almost there. And then New Glenn. Uh, New Glenn's first stage is only recoverable, so New Glenn should be about on par with Falcon Heavy in recoverable. And the reason why its numbers are a little bit more is because methane. Actually, no. Isn't New Glenn's second stage Hydrolox? I'm pretty sure it's Hydrolox. Yeah, it's, a, it's got a hydrogen upper stage and a methane first stage. The last two in the Antares numbers would fly with a Star 48. Got it. Why isn't Starship on here? Starship isn't uh, part of NASA's launch services program. Not yet, at least. Yeah, it's the BE-3. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so New Glenn's numbers would be slightly better. This shows how, uh, the bonuses of using hydrogen here. Because New Glenn recoverable and Falcon Heavy recoverable. Falcon Heavy uses a Carolox upper stage. See how the, Look at the difference in the numbers. And they have similar payload capacities. Similar, not exactly the same. They're close. But look, Hydrolox definitely gets you, affords you some, some more usefulness here. But see, the interesting thing is, is that why, why is that an A? See, that's interesting because it's higher here the curve is definitely better and then once you get out past Mars and Venus New Glenn really falls off I'm wondering why because that higher dry mass on the second stage yeah the second stage is bigger ass yeah you're not wrong the centaur stage is just too good, man. Yeah, look at look at Atlas. <laughs> Atlas is insane for what it is, dude. Even the 401 configuration move, man, they can move 2,000 pounds almost. No, that's 2,000 pounds. They can move 2,000 pounds to the to, to the asteroid belt, which is pretty crazy. Which is it's going to do that with the uh, which one is it? The Lucy mission. That's pretty nuts, man. Pretty nuts. These are, I mean, the, look, I mean, you know what the crazy part is? These are just the just the members of NASA's launch services program. This doesn't even have Arian 5 on there. It doesn't have Angara on there. It doesn't have the Long March rockets over in China. Like this is, this is just NASA LSP. The point that I'm trying to make is that we have a lot of rockets that can go this far. I mean, this is just the American stuff, which is crazy, dude. That's nuts. It's crazy. New Glenn is there, but no Starship. Blue Origin has really great lobbyists. Uh, I 
you, I mean, I, I think you might be reading too much into it. Shows how crazy in a good way the Falcon Heavy is. I agree, Arcsign. Yeah, absolutely. Nathan, you you know, I there <laughs> there could be uh I mean Starship could be on the next slide, dude, for all we know. I don't know. <laughs> but I mean the other thing to take into account, oomph, is that every aerospace contractor lobbies, SpaceX included, SpaceX lobbies a lot. A lot. A lot more than you think. Just like Boeing, just like Lockheed. Everyone does. Everyone does this. You have to. That's the only way to... You, you have to... You have to tell people about what your company's capable of before they can award you a contract to do said capability. And, you know... You can hate it. I understand why people don't like it. I get it. But I also understand why it exists too. You know what I mean? Yeah, Starship's beast mode, Raph. It's going to be insane. Hey, Smurfs, what's going on? All right, anyway. So, now, next bit of news. We're going to shift gears over to the ULA real quick. ULA tweeted out this picture. That's a picture of the Centaur upper stage for the OFT-2 Starliner mission. Uh, it has a very unique payload attachment fitting designed to launch Starliner on board. And this also is a dual-engine Centaur. Uh, it'll be the only... It'll be the second time that Atlas has, own, has flown, Atlas V, I should say, has flown with a twin RL-10 Centaur stage. The configuration for Atlas here with a Starliner on top is called the N-22 variant, uh, which is this one right here. So N-22 means no fairing, right? Two boosters on the sides and a dual engine Centaur. The second two denotes how many engines are in the second stage. So if you have an Atlas 421 over here, you have a four meter fairing, two boosters, and one engine in the Centaur upper stage. This is the N22 variant right here. No fairing, two boosters, two engines in the upper stage. That's the variant of Atlas that we're looking at here. And Starliner is scheduled to do a, um, Starliner is, what's wrong with the flags on that? Starliner is scheduled to do a second orbital flight test to hopefully work out the kinks from the first one that was in November or December of 2019 uh, on July 30th. So we got a lot of good launches at the end of this month, guys. I never understood why the Starliner adapter is shaped like that. Does it make drag? Does that make drag? No, not really. I mean, of course it does in some capacity, dudes, but so look at the 400 series fairing. Tell me aerodynamically which one of these makes more drag. Which one do you think? The Starliner adapter or that, that edge on the fairing right there? Which one do you think makes more drag? Starliner? Why? Creates more of a vortex. Turbulence? Well, turbulent air makes drag, drug, all day. Atlas 511 will never fly. Shame. So, okay. Now, look at the angle of this 400 fairing, okay? The nose cone is a, is a pretty good giveaway. So this thing is going to shoot air out, and the air, you're going to get nasty flow separation here off the front of the vehicle. This happens to every rocket, okay? So right here, the air is going to keep going, right? And it's you're going to have separation, which means you're going to have low pressure right here. And that air will basically come out and it'll find itself back down here somewhere. 
and you'll have a huge low pressure pocket right here. And keep in mind at different speeds, the angle that the air gets thrown off the side does change. Uh, so you're gonna have low pressure there anyway from the nose cone. That's why Atlas can basically fly with two different fairings because it shoots the air out and away. I'll bet you at higher speeds, it's shooting the air out so much that the air is coming back down right here. And this entire area is, a low, is low pressure. Now with Starliner, you have a more blunt nose cone. So with, with Starliner, you're shooting the air out this way. So it, it does make more drag, right? But this right here is inconsequential. It's much more about the shape of the nose cone. So this is gonna shoot air out this way. The angle that it shoots out is a big difference from that, right? This is like a 45 degree angle and that's like a 30 degree angle. So it's going to create drag, but that has nothing to do with it. There's gonna be low pressure there no matter what you do. The only time there wouldn't be low pressure there is if you use this fairing over here. In which case you're gonna get flow separation right there and you're gonna make a little bit of drag right there on the way up. Sure, absolutely. But it has to do with how these things push the air around, and that entirely has to do with the nose cone. That that's gonna be that's gonna there's gonna be low pressure there no matter what. Uh, that's just how this thing is shaped. Now, could they could they put like a five meter fairing here, right, and have five meter fairing adapt to Starliner? Sure, why not? But you have to remember there's gonna be no pressure there anyway. There's gonna, it doesn't make a difference. The fairing will not make a difference aerodynamically here. Even if you put this fairing right there, it ain't gonna change anything. It's not gonna change nothing. There's already low pressure there. So putting a wall right there isn't gonna change the fact that Starliner is pushing the air way out over here during launch, right? It's gonna push the air out this way. So whatever you put here, it doesn't matter. That's how real aerodynamics works. It does not matter what you put there. This is the other reason why, like Soyuz, for instance, if you look at the Soyuz rocket, right, you can see through the damn thing. Look. You can see through it. Does it matter? No. Does that make drag? Not really. It's much more about how the nose cone is pushing the air out of the way. That has way more to do with it. Soyuz uses a hot staging technique, so that's why they have the inner stage right here is just a bunch of struts. Uh, because they fire the third stage engine while the core stage is still, or the second stage is still ignited. So they, they, <laughs> that gas needs somewhere to go. So uh, they fire that while it's still connected and then let it go after it turns on. So they need that gas to go somewhere, right? That's, but that doesn't make drag. No, maybe a little bit, but no, doesn't make a difference. Yeah. It, when you start getting into hypersonics, so when you start going past the speed of sound, right, with this stuff, with, with aerodynamics, the air leaves a wake and it, it's not the same, but a good way to visualize it is like a boat going through water. I get it that fluids, you know, water is a liquid, our atmosphere is a gas, one's compressible, the other one isn't. But if you kind of picture a boat wake in your mind, uh, air, aerodynamics do work like that. And it's interesting because certain types of nose cones can work like a bulbous bow on a ship. They could push the water out, like a bulbous bow on a ship pushes the water out and away. At higher speeds, a blunt nose cone can push the air out of the way, just like a bulbous bow. I'll give you a case in point. Remember this thing? Remember that? That doesn't look very aerodynamic because it's designed to push plasma out of the way. So, yeah, that... Cam, I already shared the Proton Space News, dude. Uh, but yeah, that other one I'll, I'll get to. Yeah, the T-38. Yep, see? There's your wake. The shuttle nose is designed to push plasma out like this. That's This is at supersonic because that's a T-38. But yeah, supersonic wakes, boundary layers. Oh yeah, that absolutely happens. It looks like a boat wake. And the angle of the wake really depends on your speed, depends on how fast you're going. Last, it's about the Starliner skirt. 
Reason for the shape of the skirt. Okay. No fairing. We do add a skirt on the capsule to shape the aero shock reattachment on Centaur. So, Thomas, that tells me that at certain speeds, right? At certain speeds, there is air moving across this. But it's probably only for a second. I'll bet you, once you get into trans... Th that's probably for subsonic, at subsonic speeds, Thomas. I'm, I'm willing to bet that it probably is. But once you get past... The faster you go, the more that the way the wake angle goes this way. It, so it starts, when you're going slow, it starts like this, and then it moves out, and out, and out, and out, until you get that T-38 picture. Right? And then you... You know, you get into hypersonic after that. But by by the time this thing's getting to hypersonic speeds, it's out of the atmosphere. So I'll bet you that's for shaping at subsonic speeds, if, if I had to guess. Why does the second stage of the Soyuz flesh out a bit from the inner stage? I, I just explained that. Yeah, there you go. Freaking blunt nose cone is better at higher speeds. Look at that. Yeah, see? Pushes the plasma out of the way. That's pretty that's pretty rad. You ever notice how the X thirty seven, the X thirty three, the X thirty four, uh uh, all the other variants to the X-33 and the Space Shuttle all share a very similar shape if you look at them from the sides with minor variations here and there. Yeah, there's a reason for that. All right, anyway, um, it's time when I say it's time, Tree. So, yeah, let's keep going. So, here, a couple more things. Check this out. <clears throat> so, NASA EGS, Exploration Ground Systems, posted this picture. The ICPS... Uh, SLS's third stage has been bolted and they took the crane jig off. There's the top right there. The next thing in line for SLS stacking is the Orion service adapter, the OSA. Yeah, that's a pretty awesome picture. I mean, this was taken up near the top of the VAB if I'm looking at this right. Yep, there's 285. There's the crew access crew access arm is right there, right? So, no, 285 would be right here. 305 is the, or no, that's 285, that's 305. And then the top one is like uh, three, 325, I think. Um, that's the, that's how many feet you are above the, um, the deck of the mobile launcher. Yeah, not above ground level. Above ground level, this is closer to 400, 400 feet. Yeah. Yep. You can't even you can't even see the ground here. There's this picture you can't you can't see the ground. We're so this picture so high up inside of the VAB that the focal length of the camera couldn't capture the whole thing. The ground is see that level right there at the very bottom. This this piece right here that's the entrance from the high bay into the transfer aisle. That's a good 100 feet off of the ground. That should tell you how how big the VAB is. You can't even see the ground. It's ridiculous how big the, the VAB is. It, like Grand Canyon big. Well, not Grand Canyon big, but you get the idea. I mean, look at the people. Look at the people moving around on the high bays. On the high bay um, gantries. Unbelievable. Hey, look. That rocket is freaking gigantic, man. It's crazy. I would love to live stream from in here, man. So, that's the, this is the third stage for it, or stage and a half, second, second and a half stage, if you want to, if, I mean, some people like looking at that that way. Uh, what that means in plain English is that, you know, your core stage and your boosters ignite at the same time. Boosters separate, core stage flies all the way up into space, and basically the core stage gets this into space. So some people would consider that a third stage, some people consider it a stage and a half. It, 
it doesn't matter. Either way, that anything above this conic adapter right here, the launch vehicle stage adapter, anything above here is payload for SLS, which is unbelievable. That's ridiculous. Um, anything above this piece. So that, that entire stage with the Orion on top of it is going to be payload to SLS. That's what it'll get into low Earth orbit. Uh, to look more at it here, Marsha Smith posted this at Space po over at Space Policy Online, posted a picture of evolvability for, for SLS. This is the configuration that we're looking at right here. That's, the, that's this. It's a Block 1 configuration with Orion on top. Will the SLS launches be as expensive as everyone says? Pause on that one, Farway. I'll, I'll answer that in a moment. Yeah, the ICPS looks tiny until you remember that it's a 5-meter core. Exactly. Yeah, that's wider than Falcon 9. Unbelievable. So, you have the Block 1 cargo, Block 1 crew, and then you have the Block 1B, which is the one that I want. I want these two right here. This is when this is started. This is what this is when this is going to get crazy. When they give SLS the up, the upper stage, the third stage that it was supposed to have from the beginning, the exploration upper stage, which is a Hydrolox upper stage that carries four no, RL no four RL tens. Hey, caviar, twenty six month resub. Starship body was pitched as a future telescope. I I was reading about that. Interesting, right? Space shuttle closeout crew uniform was added to Discovery. Yep. Yep. That's pretty rad, Thomas. Neat. Um, so, this is what we want over here. If we really want to... Th this is the more sustainable moon rocket. This this is good for testing, I guess, right now. But I, I don't like this over here. This rocket should have been designed like this from the start. But we saved $30 billion. I digress. Getting over into these Block 2 variants is whew, getting pretty crazy. Uh, this is the good one here. This one, this one will pretty much match the capability of a Saturn V. It's a little bit below what the Saturn V could put into space, just a little bit. But it's more or less the if we're going to take lunar exploration seriously over the next ten years, this is the rocket that we need uh, for for NASA, for NASA, Starship notwithstanding, obviously. Um, and then this guy over here, uh, the SLS Block One B cargo, that one right there has a much higher payload capacity because you don't have Orion on it and it has an 8.4 meter fairing. That's about that's about the same size as Starship's internal volume but with an expendable launch vehicle. So this will get it this could get Starship payload volume basically out to the moon. Really really good. 42 tons to translunar injection, which is really really good. That if we want to, that, that way we could send bigger components and bigger stuff out to Gateway with this, right? What if SLS could launch Orion and a lander together? Well, S Master, it could do it in this, in, with this variant over here, but you run into some other problems. Um, maybe the Block 2 version could do that. This has 43 tons TLI, and Block 2 cargo has 46 TLI. Uh, but. See, they're saying inaugural flight of Block 2 in the late 2020s. Uh, this one could do it, but another thing that we have to understand here is that with this, with this guy right here, you're still limited by Orion, Orion service propulsion system. Orion's SPS doesn't have enough to circularize any useful payload into low lunar orbit because it wasn't designed to. It's designed to go to Gateway and then you use the lander to get down from there, right? So, I disagree with that design nomenclature. I think that's stupid. Uh, I think that you should be able to, Orion should be able to basically get as close to the lunar surface as it can uh, to, re to retire risk in case something goes wrong with one of the landers. Uh, personally, personally, it's just personal opinion. Uh, that's EJ's opinion. NASA clearly disagrees with me on that one, and that's cool. Um, but uh, yeah, if you're if you're using something like this, S, you're gonna need to use the lander to get into low lunar orbit, or you could just send the whole thing to Gateway, I suppose. You could just have the lander right here, right, and the EUS and Orion. Orion could dump the EUS 
uh, and then dock the lander if you put the lander in upside down, right? Orion could dock to the bottom of the lander and then pluck it and attach it to gateway. Or if you have a reusable ascent stage, all you need to do is send up descent modules, right? So if NASA has a, if NASA went for a two-stage lunar lander with a reusable ascent stage, right? Uh, and maybe even a transfer stage like what the national team wants to do, then all you need to do is just keep sending up transfer stages and descent modules, and that's it. Other rockets can handle refueling the ascent stage. So that's kind of why SLS was designed the way that it was. It's really not designed to carry a full landing, a full mission solution. It's designed to work with gateway and designed to work with two-stage, three-stage landers for the moon, which is funny because NASA chose a single-stage lander for the moon with Starship. Oh, boy. Hey, whatever. <laughs> that, just, that just gives this thing more capability, you know? Hey, Cy, what's going on? Any ideas about what those advanced SRBs could do? Um, I don't know what these are. I'll bet you these SR... So that's just a placeholder right there. These SRBs will probably end up being composite SRBs, like what you saw with Omega. I'll bet you they're... I'll bet you they're, they'll end up being Castor 1600s. Um, so Omega, five-segment version of Omega's first stage. I, I, I'm willing to bet that that's probably what they'll end up as. They're not going to build more SSMEs in the future? Nope. RS-25Es, not space shuttle main engines. RS-25Es is the new hotness. We only have enough... We only have enough space shuttle engines left over to launch four SLSs at best. The evolved SRBs are on paper... Are, are, they're not even on paper, Steiner. It's a pipe dream at this point, which is funny because the SRBs are actually just pipes. Uh, yeah. On the books, we have up... Uh, we have basically this right here. From every everywhere from here over is on the books right now. This there is nomenclature in the legislature saying that we'll go to this eventually, but saying yeah we'll do this eventually with any type of rule eight stuff means that it's not going to happen until it happens, right? This is the one that we need right here, or this is the one that's on the books right now. What's the difference between Block 1B and Block 2? The boosters. Upgraded booster design. Wii Sports. Imagine AJ260s on it. Five segments are... I mean, <laughs> an AJ260 would be, would be interesting, uh, <laughs> to say the least. But I think the five segment... Nah, the five segment doesn't put out as much thrust as the 260. I don't think. <laughs> How do you think Von Braun would do it? Would he like SLS? No. No, Swishio. Von Braun would hate this. He would hate everything about what you see on the screen. It's not It's not comprehensive enough, Swishio. Von Braun was a project manager, dude. He, On top of being a hell of an engineer. Oh, I mean, also a, a jackass if you look at his social views, but I you know, just feel the need to say that. It's relevant to understanding. But he's a heck of a project engineer. Uh, Von Braun would have wanted an integrated solution. Basically, one rocket that can get you to the lunar surface and back. So, the, the Saturn V. He would hate this. He would hate it. You know how I know? He hated the space shuttle. He couldn't stand it. He thought the space shuttle was stupid. How are you going to go back to the moon when you have a vehicle that's not capable of going back to the moon? I mean, I have to trust that he understood what the space shuttle was supposed to do. But also, at the same time, he has a very good point. The space shuttle was supposed to have the infrastructure to get back to the moon built in it from the start. But they decided, nah, just build the space shuttle and we'll figure out all the other stuff later. We'll figure out how to get back to the moon after the space shuttle starts flying. Don't worry, just build the core stage first. We'll figure out how to get to the moon after that, after SLS starts flying. Von Braun would have hated this. He would have. He would have hated it, and he would be. I. I, I don't speak for the guy. He's obviously dead. But I. I have a very good feeling that he would be pissed. We're not. Uh, we're not like. We don't have a city on the moon at this point. He would be pissed, like pissed. Tonnage on the block two. Forty-three tons TLI for crew. Forty-six for cargo. 
I'm a big fan of on-orbit assembly, but also history kind of proved Von Braun what right. He would probably like Starship, Hellfish. Yeah, he would. He would like Starship. Absolutely. Yeah. He. he... Dude, I firmly believe that Elon. Elon's probably read all about Von Braun. He. Uh, he's Elon. A lot of so Tesla has a lot of business strategies that are in line with Henry Ford's business strategies uh, from a hundred years ago. Oh, there's no market for cars? Cool, I'll mass produce them and I'll make a market for cars. That was Henry Ford's strategy. Elon Musk is, oh, there's no market for electric cars? Okay, I'll mass produce electric cars. And just like Von Braun, Elon Musk with SpaceX has shown, has demonstrated a favorable, uh, demonstrated favorability for a fully, uh, an end-to-end -end solution. Something that's going to get you from the launch pad to the moon with with one spaceship for the most part. Uh, I mean, Starship is kind of... Starship does have that refueling thing, but... You know, I think Von Braun ultimately wanted to do something like that. If you look at some of his early concepts for moon rockets, he wanted to do something like that. Did Henry Ford also like panel gaps? Mad Cobra, with Model Ts to keep the costs down, they used the crates that the engines were shipping, the en that the, the crates that the engines were shipped to the production line, they were wood, right? Uh, they used that, they didn't just take that wood and throw it away, they used it to make the floorboards of the car. So, uh, you tell me. Yeah. If you're ramping mass production quickly, you're going to have some QA problems, but you'll figure it out over time, and Tesla has figured it out over time. The build quality has gone up a lot in the last five years, to say the least. Yeah, you can have any color you want as long as it's black. There you go. I will also pay my workers enough to buy said cars. I'm telling you, no, Mr. Vaughn, he's taking pages right out of Henry Ford's book. And Von Braun. I would actually be curious to ask him, like, did you, like, read Von Braun's, like, biography and then decide to go make rockets? Like, I'd be I'd be curious to see if he's read it. He pro I bet you he has. 43 tons TLI is absolutely insane. Does Doodles, the magic number with, with rockets that go to the moon is 40 metric tons. Uh, so 88,000 pounds. If you can shoot 88,000 pounds at the moon, that's kind of the magic number for getting people to the surface. Yeah. And that's why SLS in its early configurations doesn't do that because it's not designed to do that. It's designed to go to Gateway and then go to the moon. It's funny how people harp on Tesla build quality as if every other manufacturer doesn't have similar QC issues. Yeah. Thailand, other manufacturers have QC issues. It happens from time to time. You're never going to get 100% quality assurance when you're mass producing. That's just not how that works. But also, every other automaker around has had at least 50 years more experience in this in Tesla. And I think Tesla has stepped up to the plate a lot faster than it took those other guys to figure this stuff out, right? I mean, they figured it out 50, 60, 70 years ago. Some, some 100. Ford... With Ford, it's 118. Ford was founded in 1903. So, can you believe that? A, corp a freaking company has been around for 100 and 118 years? That's ridiculous. And I, I get it. I get it. I get it. There's more. There's companies. Guinness has been around since 1759. Like, they have it right on the can. Say, don't ask me why I have this here, okay? Like, there are companies that have been around a lot further, a lot more than that, but a car company has been around for a hundred... A hundred and eighteen years. That's weird. Why do you have that right there? I said don't ask. Can confirm, as a person who worked for a company supplying parts for major car companies, problems will happen. Too many, too many steps involve Blueland to not have a mistake. Somewhere along the line. Yeah, VB Green. That one's weird. Anyway, let's keep the news going, dudes. Uh, so, yeah. Crazy. This is just the start, man. We gotta... We're, NASA really needs to get more of these things. 
more of these things built uh, with RS-25Es, but uh, that's going to require a substantial funding bump, but it's possible. You just got to have the right guy steering NASA's helm, and I think we do. I think we have the right guy with Jim, and I think we have the right guy with Bill. Bill will get it done. He didn't ask. He stated. Other manufacturers giving Tesla grief for not having manufacturing issues. They should. They solved decades ago. It's weird when, with all that experience, they're not making a better EV than Tesla. Yeah, I know. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, if you're gonna disrupt a market like that, you're gonna get flack. Obviously, fully automated. Yeah, we got that, Reagan. Yes, it will be fully automated. That's gonna be cool. Seeing that thing just drive back into the port by itself. It's going to be ridiculous. Bill has been to Space Forlorn. That's right. All right. So this is an exclusive coming from CNET here uh, about the X-59. And it just had some things that we haven't seen before. The X-59 is a, um, it's called a low boom supersonic transport. Um, long story short, what that means is this is a, an aircraft, a prototype aircraft that NASA is working on that try, that is trying to break the sound barrier and not make a sonic boom. It's one of the newest X-planes with the X-57 uh, that NASA is working on. Uh, Jim, the previous NASA administrator, Jim Bridenstine, helped try to kickstart the uh, X-plane program again. Because remember, uh, the first A in NASA is for aeronautics. So NASA should be pushing the boundaries with planes and spaceships. First half is basically talking about why it's being why it's a thing. That being said, there's a lot of nice B-roll. I'm in it for the B-roll. I don't. I can explain what this thing does. Yeah. Huh. The stage is a building now, but when it finally takes to the skies, this aircraft right here could change the sight and sound of aviation uh, forever. I see what you did there. Let's see. Aluminum. All aluminium. The team behind the X-59 wants to do the seemingly impossible. Fly an aircraft that breaks the sound barrier without creating an explosive sonic boom for everyone on the ground below. And NASA and Lockheed Martin have given us exclusive access for the very first look at this aircraft to find out how it works. Look at it. It's got an S duct in it like a Formula One car. <laughs> yeah, the nose looks like a platypus almost. Here, for more people that want to check this out, uh, we're not going to watch the whole video, but uh, if you want to watch the whole video, I'll link it up in chat. I just want to see the B-roll footage. I know what this thing does. If you guys have questions, just ask. It's just... They're probably saying something about the Concorde right now and how the Concorde was revolutionary for its time, but uh, it had problems making supersonic booms, which relegated it to Atlantic crossings only. Ready? Watch. Supersonic passenger travel has the power to revolutionize the aviation industry. Wait for it. The promise of shooting through the skies at a thousand miles per hour, faster than the speed of sound. Breakfast in Paris, dinner in New York. They but didn't do it, the but they will. He has never quite been able to keep up with that dream. There she goes. Hey! A big moment. Through the sound. Glamorous Glennis. When Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier in 1947, that launched a generation hey, I've been of there. experimental that's, aircraft. That's the Armstrong the Flight Research Center. I stood right there. One of those is behind me, the X-1E, Yay. one of the first planes to break through the sound barrier. But that high speed came at a high cost with the sonic boom. See? In the early days of aviation, the only people that could experience supersonic flight oh. were military test pilots. Oh. But by the late 1960s, supersonic travel broke oh, into the mainstream. Oh, look at that thing. Oh, that thing is so legit. Civilian passengers. And at the forefront was Concorde. 
The Concorde, first commercial supersonic transport, has its public debut at Toulouse in southern France. A joint effort between British Airways and Air France, the Concorde flew up to 100 passengers and had a cruising speed of Mark II, twice the speed of sound. Mm. The end of the runway is Concorde. See the armpit wings? We talked about those yesterday. Suddenly, anyone yeah. can fly at supersonic speeds. By the mid-90s, a round trip from JFK uh. to Heathrow cost around $8,000, or the equivalent of about $15,000 today. But while the Concorde commercialized wow. supersonic flight, it also brought that sonic boom. The prospect was you would have planes flying supersonically every day over your home and breaking the sound barrier all day, all night. In 1973, the Federal Aviation Administration issued an order banning supersonic flight over land. Because it could only operate in certain places, that limited a number of routes, that limited how much money it could make, and ultimately the airlines realized this is just too expensive to operate. In October 2003, the Concorde was retired for good. The sonic boom has been holding back supersonic passenger flight ever since, but NASA oh. wants to change that. Here at the Armstrong Flight Research Center, NASA I've been has that been researching I've said in that plane. flight for decades. Now it's on a new quest cool. for quiet supersonic technology. It's recruited Lockheed Martin to build a brand new low boom <sighs> aircraft using breakthroughs in aeronautic design, the snoot. material science, it and droops. computational modeling. A supersonic oh, plane yeah. so sleek so cutting edge no I, i've i've stood in that I, i've sat in that f-15 das and i went in 2017 we went to edwards and nasa took us on a tour that's nasa's f that's one of nasa's flight research f-15s it's like serial number three or something off the assembly line it's old school and they let they let me sit in it i can't fit in an f-15 with the canopy down for what it's worth i looked like jeremy clarkson driving around an mx-5 You're cooler than us, we get it! <laughs> I'm I don't think so, no Mr. Vaughn. Anyway. That when it flies, the sonic boom becomes a sonic thump. To understand how NASA and Lockheed are reshaping flight, it's worth knowing a little bit about the science of sound. Cool. Sound no? waves are essentially waves of compressed air that move through space kind of like a pulse in a slinky, traveling from the source yep. at a speed of roughly 340 meters per second. Mark one. But when a supersonic jet flies faster than the speed of sound, what's known as breaking the sound barrier, it's moving faster than the compressed air can move out of the way. Think of it like a boat traveling through the water. The waves build up and move out in a V-shaped wake. It's the same for a supersonic jet, but in three dimensions. Instead of sound waves moving out in front of the aircraft, That's what I say. they're forced together, producing shock waves that travel behind the aircraft in a cone. And that's what we hear on the ground as a sonic boom. It's also directional, like a speaker. People on the ground only hear that boom when a supersonic plane flies above them. But that sound is actually constant. A sonic boom measures more than 100 decibels. That's about as loud as a fireworks display. Yep. And if a supersonic plane was flying over the United States, I had planned this that from the start, Pixie. Would be heard by everyone underneath the path of the aircraft. I'm taking to it into account. Don't worry. shock waves on the ground, you need to change the shape of the plane and make it far more streamlined. Make. Any big variation make. in shape, like a cockpit jutting up at the front, can produce a shock wave. This the is right. This is, is a to really smooth good. Out those variations. This is really, really good reporting. Actually, this is all. That's that's exactly one hundred percent correct. Uh, yeah, th this is great. That that was perfect. By everyone underneath the path of the aircraft. Yeah. To minimize those shock waves on the ground, you need to change the shape of the plane and make it far more streamlined. Any big variation in shape, like a cockpit jutting up at the front, can produce a shock wave. The idea is to smooth out those variations, which reduces the shock waves, and then spread them out across the body of the plane. Mm -hmm. At just under 100 feet long, the X-59 is shorter than the Concorde, but more streamlined and with a much longer nose. The wings are swept back to reduce drag. 
and there's no canopy sticking up at the front of the plane for the cockpit. Each of those design points helps spread out and separate the shockwaves produced by the aircraft, which in turn reduces the sonic boom. Mm -hmm. The hope is to cut that boom from the 105 decibels produced by the Concorde down to 75 decibels. According to NASA, that's equivalent to the sound of a car door slamming down the street. The X-59, if you look at it, notice it's a very long airplane. It's nearly 100 feet long just to carry one person. And so that's what we're doing. We're dragging out, if you will, those those volume changes, making them very... I'm sorry, I was looking at the F-15. Uh, body of the airplane. Oh, God. As the company I was looking at the, I was looking at the F-15, the X -59 guys. For NASA, Lockheed sorry, Martin man. was tasked with designing, building, and iterating this new low-boom supersonic aircraft. Oh, but unlike sick. the 60s, when designing a new plane meant building and testing scale models in wind tunnels, Lockheed can use something called computational hey. fluid dynamics. Hey, 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 back it up, back it up, real quick. The 60s, so, when designing a new plane... Look, 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 real quick. That, that right there. Look. See what the armpit wing does? This is what Concorde does, and this is why Concorde has such a hot, like, lands, and why the nose droops down. This is why it needs to land at a high angle of attack. Because the wing, having a strake and a delta wing, at high angles of attack, it creates a huge vortex off of each wing, just like that. And that creates a crazy amount of turbulent air over the wing and extremely high uh, pressure air underneath the wing. Concorde makes insane amounts of lift at high angles of attack. That's the only way they could get something that's very streamlined to land correctly. That's what it does right there. There's a visualization of creating vortexes over the wings at high angles of attack. That's it. Oh, that's so cool. Dynamics. Essentially getting a computer to nice. simulate different designs nice, and the kind of shock waves they would produce. The physics have been around forever. It's just being able to model those effectively. And with the advent of fast computers, you can iterate very quickly between the geometry and then analyze that in the computer to learn, well, what does this geometry do to help us to reduce those shocks and, then, and stretch those out to make the boom quieter. After years of iteration, the X-59 is in the final stages of its build in Palmdale, California, at Lockheed Martin's Skunk Works division. Inside this right. high security facility, the company designs and builds breakthrough aviation technologies, oh. most of which we can't actually see because they're classified. But we've been given unprecedented access to CDX-59 as the final assembly takes place. Oh, that's so damn so cool. So I'm actually inside the body of the X-59 right now, something I never thought I'd say. And I have to say, inside here, you can really appreciate how long and narrow this airplane is. It's about two body widths wide and it's amazing to be inside an experimental aircraft. I never thought I'd get to see something like this so close and personal. Skunk Works is up and working on other craft. They never stopped, man. They just didn't tell anybody, dude. Yeah, of course. What do you think they've been doing? What do you think they've been doing since freaking the F-22? Of course. Of course they're making other things, duh. I'm, like hyped to, I'm hyped to find out in 30 years. Yeah, me too, man. <laughs> are just perfectly designed. Yeah, me too. This airplane is being perfectly designed it's cool, to fly man. supersonic as quiet as it can. Oh, that's and so So legit. these are not things that, so that cool. basically you know, a computer or man would say, this is what it should be. This is what Mother Nature is saying. No, this is what I want. So what you can see behind me, you might think of an airplane wing as being fairly straight and flat, but if you look down here, you can see it kind of looks like a bird. It's a gull wing design, and that is designed to make the air flow smoothly over the aircraft, once again, so we don't hear those shock waves that become the sonic boom. Of course he does, Tree. Link, While sure, the man. shape of this aircraft Some is great cutting footage edge, of the, plane the here. actual body is made up of parts that are already used in other planes. Landing gear from an F-16, a cockpit and ejector seat from a T-38 jet. Cool. But there is one new feature on the inside that sets the X-59 apart. Because Lockheed wanted to minimise big changes in air pressure, it had to do away with the large cockpit windows sticking up Ooh. at the front of the plane. In fact, there's no front window at all. Interesting. Instead, 
The X59 has an external vision system, or XVS, designed and built by NASA. The XVS uses two cameras above and below the aircraft to create a real-time view of the front of the plane shown on an HD screen. Sensors across the aircraft also feed in data, meaning the screen doubles as a heads-up display for the pilot. For NASA test pilot Nils Larsen, that high-tech display brings advantages oh, over a traditional Thomas. cockpit window. Essentially, it's very much like a heads-up display that you would see in a fighter aircraft. So you have your uh, airspeed on the left-hand side, you have your altitude on the right-hand side. I can see the, you know, Yeah, there the you go, Thomas. I have a flight path uh, vector or marker that I can uh, move and put on the horizon, like that which all. makes it a lot easier to fly. It actually gives us sometimes more capability than you might have if it was just a window. I know you guys are giving me crap. You're busting my balls, like what I like what I said yesterday. But literally every single person I've talked to that's ever flown an airplane has said that they're never, they'd never do, they'd never do something like this. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, I'm just telling the anecdotes that I heard from people that actually fly planes. And I'm not talking about people that just go and fly Cessnas. I'm talking about people that fly like passenger planes around that watch the stream. Uh, there's all different types of pilots around that watch this stream. Anything from a Cessna 152 all the way up to a C5. Yeah. Not one of them has said, oh yeah, that's fine. I'll, I'll do that. Back at Lockheed, the team is in the final stages of the build, which involves installing electrical systems, connecting you'd the fly, tail you'd fly and planes, you'd fly, you'd long fly planes. nose to the main body Good. of the plane. Good. Have fun with that. And getting the aircraft. I'll listen to the people that actually do that for a living. Yes, sorry, don't take that the wrong way. Ready to fly, but assembling the aircraft is only half the story. Once the X-59 is built, it needs to go <laughs> yeah, through rough, three right. phases of testing. After Lockheed runs its initial test flights in phase one to make sure the plane can actually fly, it'll hand over the keys to NASA for phase two, acoustic testing. That's sick. And that's where things get really cool. NASA will send up an F-15 jet to fly around the X-59 and measure the shock waves produced in the air. The idea is to make sure oh, they're behaving what a as plane. expected. Then it's going to photograph the X-59 mid-flight and capture what's known as a Schlieren image, showing the ah yes, the Schlieren actual shock waves around the plane. Photographing a plane going faster than the speed of sound that takes skill. The X-59 cool. airplane has to eclipse the sun, if you will, because we use the sun as a backdrop for our Schlieren photography, and all of that has to happen perfectly. It's like threading a needle to get that uh, gorgeous. Oh, image. that's so then damn cool! NASA needs to measure the sonic thump at ground level. But because the plane is traveling so fast, that sound could be spread across an area up to 50 nautical miles wide. So NASA is setting up an array of microphones with 70 sensors spread across 30 nautical miles. That way, they'll be able to measure the volume of the sonic thump from the plane flying 60,000 feet overhead. Cool. After all that acoustic testing comes phase three. Hey. NASA will fly the X-59 above a... Wait a minute. ...from the plane flying 60,000 feet That was Johnson overhead. Space Center. After all that acoustic testing comes phase... Yeah, it looks like they were doing some uh, sonic boom testing a little, little way south of Johnson there. <laughs> sonic boom propagation right there. I think that's what that's called. Is three when NASA will fly the X-59 above a handful of communities, both in busy cities and quiet rural areas, to see how people actually respond to the noise. NASA is going to present all this data to regulators with the goal of lifting the 1973 ban on commercial supersonic flight. After all, back in the 70s, noise was the problem. But if NASA can prove that supersonic planes can fly without the boom, then speed shouldn't matter. This could open the door to a whole new generation of supersonic flight, and there are plenty of companies waiting in the wings yeah, ready snake, to take right? advantage. Companies like Exosonic, which has won a contract with the US Air Force to develop a low boom supersonic executive transport. Imagine much, a future man. where Air Force One could go supersonic. And then there's Boom Supersonic, which has partnered with United Airlines and is working towards transatlantic and transpacific flights by 2029. 
With so much happening in this space, supersonic passenger flights could be closer than we think. Oh man, this is sick, dude. The B-roll footage now, is the B-roll footage is so Martin legit. Focusing on getting their one and only demonstrator aircraft into the skies, and after decades of research and years of design and development, that first X-59 flight is going to be a huge milestone. I wish that everyone could experience a first flight because it, it, is, it is one of the most emotional things that you go through. And it okay. is really what makes this job and all the heartache and, and, and the stress worth it, is when you see that airplane fly. There is a very personal sense of accomplishment, but also for an airplane nut like me, um, it's emotional. As a test pilot, this is what you live for. This is an X plane. That guy and this planes. This is research. That guy planes. This just, guy planes. There's the cool factor just to us is, you know, this is why I became a test pilot. Is to go and do something like this. So, am I excited? You betcha. That was very, very well written and very well researched, man. Good on CNET for sure. I'll link this again if you guys want to see it. Wow. Is heat a factor when you go fast enough, Kuro? Sure. Oof. Yeah, that was really good. Good on them. That's really good reporting. Also, just... Hello. This B-roll footage is money. Look. They put a hump right there going into the intake. You see how the intake looks like a, a star, a Star Trek, a Starfleet symbol that ate too much, bur had too many burgers. See that? See how there's that hump right there? What they're trying to do is eliminate the flow separation that happens. Because if this, if this was a perfect circle, some of the air would come down here and shoot off to the side and create a vortice here or vortex. They're trying to basically scoop the air up that's flowing off the fuselage right there. <clears throat> that's cool, man. It's a yeah, it's a Pac-Man. Walk 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 walk. That's cool, Core. Great video, man. All right. So, last last two things here coming from NASA Space Flight here. This is a video uh calling from uh, coming from Paulina Kalen out on the west coast here of the other drone ship. Of course, I still love you. We saw a shortfall at Gravitas, right? Of course, I still love you uh arriving into Long Beach. Now, I wouldn't normally show this. We'd probably go right to Starship at this point in time, but check some of this out. It's unbelievable. Some of this footage is really freaking cool. And something like that, Pythos. I mean, it's more about minimizing the, t the vortexes that that thing makes. If you can minimize the vortexes, right? You you can lower the sonic, but you can lower the the decibel level, the sonic boom. I mean, it also it'll go faster. I mean, there's also that. Freaking cool though. Look at that, Port of Long Beach, mighty servant. They boated a boat on a bigger boat. Well, drone ship, yes. So the mighty servant is a is a uh, floating dry dock. That's a dry dock, right? Notice the people. Note the scale. Right? And watch. I, I wonder if NSF got footage of this. I hope Pauline did. This is this is cool. This is really cool. It's a ship that's hauling a ship that lands rockets on it. So Mighty Servant is actually designed to partially sink itself into the water. And that's how they got the drone ship up on top. You'd think, you know, if you didn't know too much about this, you'd think that they took the drone ship, probably picked it up with a crane, right? And put it on here. No, no, that's too complicated. Also, I, if there's a crane that can lift that thing up, I'd be really impressed. Oh, harbor pilot right there. <clears throat> uh, the boat actually, the, the mighty servant actually sinks. It partially sinks itself to lower, to increase its draft or basically how far it goes into the water. And then if you wanted to get something on it or get something off of it, you're gonna get something off, it just floats away, right? But if you wanted to get something on it, you'd position it underneath the ship and then pumps, pump all the water out and the ship decreases draft and basically picks up something on its back. F floating dry dock.
Oh, cool. Look at the people crawling around on crawling around on that thing that should give you the scale here. KSB question, can you run fuel lines between two separate craft landed next to each other using EVA? No, has to be the same ship. Uh, the scale is what gets me, guys. The scale is unbelievable. As what you can do, though, um, what you could do is ha attach a docking port to one ship and then gizmo the docking port out, right? Fuel line from whatever you attach the docking port to to the docking port and then gizmo the docking port around and the fuel line should be able to go with it. Put another docking port on whatever you're trying to refuel and then just use Kerbal Construction to move the docking ports near each other. They should dock. So is Mighty Servant 1 a boat or a ship? Ship. Mighty Servant's a ship. Boats you can take out of water. Ships you need a dry dock for. But Mighty Servant is a, is, is a dry dock. So maybe Mighty Servant divides by zero and we call it a, a bip or a shoat. I, I'll say shoat. Yeah, we'll call it shoat. Yeah, this footage though. Damn, that thing is cool. So see, there's a mooring plate at the back, at the, at the stern part of the dry dock out here. There's a mooring plate, see it right there? See the posts? Those, these guys right here. And when they, when they sank the ship, they, those, they basically tied the drone ship to those posts, to those mooring posts, right? Like it was a dock and then they floated it up. See the two posts? They moored it to that when the ship was in the water, when it was sunk down, moored the drone ship to those things, and then they used that as a datum to line everything up. And then the ship unsubmerged itself. Could use a repaint. I love that the rocket rocket exhaust is so ridiculously abrasive, it just burned the paint right off. That's that's the reason why they spray the, uh, the drone ships down with water before the Falcon lands, because it provides a, a film cool... It provides film cooling on the surface. He'll buff out. I like the name Shat. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure you do. Oh, oh some guy's welding something down there. That's so cool. That's so damn cool. Mighty Servant fills its ballast tanks to sink into the water. Give us the time lapse, NSF! Give us the time lapse! I mean, they could just land rockets on the Mighty Servant. So with the new drone ship, do you think SpaceX is going to renovate the older drone ships to look more like it? No. I don't think so, Apollo. They need to use them. They can't take them out of service because they have to land rockets. Maybe at some point. But I think a shortfall of Gravitas is a good indicator, Apollo, of what Phobos and Deimos are probably going to look like. The SpaceX rigs, the SpaceX oil rigs that they want to land Starship out on. Yeah, I'll bet you that's a pretty good indicator of what those are going to look like. And if, dude, if that's the case, it's going to look so cool. It's going to look straight up like a Bond villain's evil lair. And you know what? It's going to be awesome. <laughs> hey, Mac. It's your annoying fellow mass hole. What's up? Hey, man. How you doing? How thick do you think that plating on the deck is to withstand rocket exhaust? Well, Kirinov, not very thick. It's only for a second. It's, it, it's only for a second. Have you ever taken a torch to something, like to a piece of metal? It takes a second for the metal to conduct all that heat. The same thing with the drone ship. You have a big, wide plate of metal, and if you're heating up one spot, then, well, the metal will move the heat around pretty well. Uh, so, 
if you had the rocket engine firing on that thing for like a minute straight, oh yeah, I'd burn a hole right through it. But since it's really only for, I don't know, maybe 10 seconds, and 10 seconds is even pushing it. Look at the guy crawling up, Mighty Servant. The scale on this is just ridiculous. Because it only it's only there for a second, it's not that bad. Spraying the, spraying the drone ship down with water is enough to protect the metal. I know, because, well, that's what they do it, and they haven't blown a hole in one yet. Minus the world domination, hopefully. Well, Elon Musk... Wait, wait, hold on, Sneaky. Minus the world domination. Well, what world are we talking about here? Are you a Bond villain if you want to dominate Mars? This, this is a pertinent question. Okay, Thomas, neat. What if, what if, are you a, are you really a Bond villain if you want to conquer Mars and not Earth? Does that, does that make you a Bond villain or, or are you like a Denob, like Bond backwards or something? Are you a Denob villain? Mark Watney was not a Bond villain. That You know what? That's a very good point, Manga. Very good point. That's the plot of Doom. So what you're telling me is that Elon Musk likes listening to power metal while he slaughters aliens. Is that a villain? Like, I don't know. <laughs> Von Brown prophesied that Elon would be the ruler of Mars. I mean, that's oddly specific, Lundprod, but yeah. Elon's more of Tony Stark. But Tony Stark really didn't want to conquer Mars, per se. No, that makes you the new mil villain in Mars Attacks too, Elon Boogaloo. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Anyway. Fair, Hazanku. Fair, fair, fair. No, it just makes you Marvin the Martian. Where was the kaboom? There was supposed to be an earth-shattering kaboom! Discovery, go at throttle up. Torg! 10-month resub. So if Elon lands on Mars and instantly says dibs, does he own Mars then? I mean... Maybe? Look, ship's slowly sinking itself. They didn't even need to fully submerge the thing. The thing can be submerged another five meters, which is pretty nuts. That's about 15 feet, maybe a little bit more than 15 feet, which is nuts. That's crazy. And there it goes. Bye bye. Bye bye. That's cool, Kuro. Wife still hates that instrument. It's not my problem. I missed the part where that's my problem. 1202. What is 1202? 1203 is gasoline. I don't know what 1202 is. Man, that thing is big. <laughs> G-Funky. So would there be crew cabins and all that below deck? Or would it be all under the bridge area? 
Uh, under the bridge area is where the people stay. Yeah, you don't want to have people sleeping down in the lower bowels of the ship. Their water, water happens there. It's the alarm that threw the Apollo 11 during descent. Yeah, I mean that's that's true. 1202 is diesel or just gasoline. Okay. okay. Hello, Sarah. UN hazard code 1202 is diesel. So it's for the diesel generators that are on board Forfa. Like those ones. The blue things right there. Okay, that explains that. Uh, no, Morty, I filled it up with diesel, mate. Double skin 41. Tanker. Tanker? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, tanker. Oh, nope, not a tanker. Barge. We're watching the drone ship uh, smoked. This is one of SpaceX's landing ships. Uh, they moved it over to the west coast. Jack's finally home. Yeah, that's right. Jack shot this footage here. Let's let's blaze through. Oh, that's the end of the footage. But it's still cool, man. That's so gnarly. Mighty Servant's cool, man. We need stuff like this in space. We should launch this into space. I mean, I don't know what it would do up there, but we, you know, it'd be cool. It'd be cool to have like a, a, a space dry dock. Okay. Okay, that would be cool, all right? You can't say that it wouldn't be. Anyway, here's your Starship update, and then it's time for Kerbal. We'll watch it in two times speed to save some time. Whoop. Can we get a space wet dock? I mean... Yes? Ooh. This is from the test yesterday. Ooh. Vent lock. Interesting. What? Wait. What are those supposed to do? What are those? That's interesting. I'd be more impressed if they made a wet dock in space. Okay. I wonder why the vents are positioned like that. That's the... Methane tank? I slept through it, user username, whatever, whatever it did. 1203 is for diesel and electric generators. 1202 is gas, or 1203 over here is gasoline, chief. 1202, people were telling me, is diesel. Up oh, there's the, there's the thrust jacks. They, uh, put the thrust simulator, or the load simulator, on to suborbital pad B. Uh... That thing is generally put onto a pad like this when they're test when SpaceX is going to test uh, a Starship out. That's that thing has been there. That thing has been there uh, for all the other Starship tests. Basically, what they do is there's um, a bunch of hydraulic jacks right here, and they push up on the vehicle uh, to simulate the force that Raptors would be putting on the vehicle. Um, during like ascent or during uh, 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 flight, right? Uh, so it's called the load simulator. Um, they, yeah, so like say they'll pressurize the tanks and then they'll push up on the bottom of it. You know, if the thing pops, you, you know, the hydraulic jacks aren't going to care, but you don't want to, you don't want to figure out that your bulkheads aren't structurally good enough uh, after the fact, like after you've launched it. So they use this for ground testing. That's on pad B or parking lot B, I guess. This is how you make a parking lot launch pad. Yeah, that's how you do that. Isn't Earth basically a wet dock in space for rockets? Uh, sure, why not? Yes, that'd be, that'd be cool. Oh, thanks, King. Appreciate it. Well, we saw 1202, or yeah, we saw 1202 on the side of the drone ship, and we know that it uses diesel generators, so I'm willing to say that it's probably diesel. Ah, no, Morty. I filled it up with diesel, mate. Look at, the, look at that little baby lattice crane. That's cute. Look at that little baby lattice crane. That's cute. My boy's wicked smart. What up, man? How you doing, guy? 
Where's the power boom? It's uh, it's down right now, Stephen. They're modifying it so they can put the the. They're making the crane taller so they can put the uh, the pieces on top of the fixed service structure. I wonder if that 31K is still planning to show up. Yeah, Thomas, I heard that through the grapevine, so take that one with a grain of salt. But yeah, I'm I'm interested why we would hear that and then not have it show up. Turks. <laughs> yeah, man. It's pretty crazy. Nitrogen. Last I heard was that they were having some issues with it. Hmm. Ah, you can tell that thing is carrying liquid nitrogen because of the way it is. It's pretty neat. Well, there's your code for, 19, for, for liquid nitrogen. It's 1977. What historical marker is near there? Rio Grande, Rio Grande Valley. Denny. It's the Rio Grande estuary. It's where, where the river that much of the United States and Mexico much it makes up the border between the United States and Mexico. It's a really long river. Uh, the Rio Grande, that's where it ends and goes into the Gulf of Mexico. Another Raptor, RB5. RB5 and RB6. Sebastian Vettel somewhere is going. That's a good one. That's a good one, yeah, yeah. That's a really good name. Do you think Elon is always there? He smoked, he works. Yeah. Yeah. He bought essentially a trailer from his own anecdote on Twitter. He bought a trailer and he lives down the street from this. He lives in a trailer down by the river. Yeah, he didn't build himself a mansion or anything. Guy, the guy's a workaholic, dude. Hmm. That tent is flying. Okay. Ah, yes, yeah, that's a keeper. He's there as much time as he can be, Smoked. He's, he, Elon is not the president of SpaceX. Gwen Shotwell is. Elon's the chief designer. He's the chief engineer. He, he is designing the rocket. He's there with everybody else, engineering and building the rocket. He did the... Well, I mean, the funny thing is, is that he is the CEO of Tesla. He did the same thing. When there was Model 3 production... Elon straight up went down onto the production lines and, and slept on a cot in a conference room uh, to help optimize the Model 3 production. And the guy's a workaholic, dude. Yeah, he sold all of his other houses because people, I don't know, somebody somebody was like, you you know, you're not like the workers. You, 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 you know, if you were like the worker, you would sell your houses. You know, if you wanted to, you know, if you wanted to show how good of a person you are, you'd sell all your houses. And he said, yeah, fine, whatever. Okay, sure. Sold all of his houses. All right. And people still give him crap, which is funny. Something like that, Sebi. That's right, Mac. Yeah, guy sold all of his stuff. There's the, uh, so this is at the uh, propellant plant that they're working on. Oh, here we go. Here's the big crane. They're modifying the big crane. Watch, see, they're going to move this thing into position. They're going to attach it over there. Yeah, but it's net worth, Forlorn. It's not like he has a billion dollars in his bank account. I think the people that drum that beat that drum have no idea how economics work. Just because you're net worth a billion, just because you're a billionaire, doesn't mean you have a billion dollars in your account. The billion dollars, if I had to guess, with Elon is probably what you're seeing here on the screen. That's an important thing for people to understand. Net worth does not equal what you have in your bank account. In Elon Musk, you, and I don't speak for him and I don't know for sure, but I do know that Elon Musk is notorious for dumping all of his money back into equity in the company. That's how SpaceX and Tesla got off the ground. SpaceX, literally. 
he dumped all of his he dumped all of his money into it. it every time Tesla started to turn a profit he dumps all of he, he cashes out his shares and dumps that money right back into the company Yeah, it's, it's an important economic thing to understand. Net worth, does, net worth is basically all what you have in your bank account and all the stuff that you own. Hey, paramedic, long time no see. Thought of you this past Sunday, Camino. We did a live link with the ISS and interviewed Shane Kimbrough. That's cool, man. Awesome. His rockets are assets. Absolutely. The rockets are assets, Vinny's. His shares in Tesla, assets. His ownership of SpaceX, yeah, that's that's where his net worth comes from. All of Elon's assets are in his companies. When he needs liquid wealth, he takes out loans and uses his assets as collateral. There you go. That's right, King. That's cool, Mac. If Elon ever offered me a job at SpaceX, oh, would you take it? Yeah, sure, probably. It's one of the few things that would get me away from the stream. I like working for myself. Not really a fan of working for other people. Working for yourself is nice because you're only accountable to yourself. It's a good way to, I like it. I, I like living this way. It's fun. I enjoy it. It's a challenge. I'm worth something above zero dollars. My net worth is... I think my net worth is a net negative. <laughs> if you really wanted to know. I'm pretty sure it's a net negative. <laughs> By probably about 20 or 30 grand easily. <laughs> oh, shoot. I'm pretty sure I have a negative net worth. God dang, God dang debt. Oops. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh. Boy, I hate debt. It sucks. It's not fun. Anyway. Alright. Time for Kerbal? Time for Kerbal? Time for Kerbal. Let's go. Oh wait, there is one more bit of uh one more bit of Russian space news here. And it's about nuclear tug, so you probably probably want to peep this real quick. You are less net negative now. Thanks, Jeff. Can you take a look at the Minecraft Discord channel for my building request? Sure. So, what is this? This is coming from Anatoly Zach. Space, space war and human missions to Mars are listed as among the goals of Russia's newly dedicated nuclear tug. Space war. Oh, that's, that's good. Oh, uh, yeah. These are all the pieces to the nuclear tug that they're working on. Interesting. Nice, Sebi. Cool username. What if KSP2 opens a marketplace for crafts? Well, that would be really nice, Luizo, but I probably wouldn't charge much. I already, my profit, I mean, yeah, I could, if if I could sell my craft files, that'd be really cool, but I'd probably, like, sell one for, like, I don't know, five cents or something. <laughs> like, I already make money off of building them on stream. I mean, a dollar would be cool. That'd be nice. Probably make a good amount of money, but I'm, that's not why I'm. In, that's not why I'm into doing this. To be honest. The thing on the truck has just been delivered to the launch area. What is that? Yeah, I'd rather do something like that, Brian. Just realized it's Falcon 9 Friday. What is this supposed to be, Thomas, other than a big hunk of metal next to a FedEx truck?
Kerbal Craft NFTs. I suppose I could do that, Luizo. No clue, but it's still at the launch area. The Raptor truck went to the launch area already. Hmm. Dingle bops. Dingle bops everywhere. All right. Kerbal time. Let's go. We have a mission to launch. Okay, got that. Got that. Got that. All right, cool. Here we go. All right, we got. I want to try to get two missions done with the SSTO. So we have one poised on the pad. We just basically need to fuel it and send it. I had some problems with the gantry crane, though. That, uh, yeah. Yeah, but it's it's ready to go. So we'll see if we'll see if the pad can take two launches back to back. So I'm basically going to try to send this thing up into space, 